This is the Danger Close Podcast. Beyond the Books with me, Jack Carr. Welcome to the Danger Close Podcast, an Ironclad original presented by Navy Federal Credit Union. My guest today is SAS veteran Ben Garwood. Ben's a fascinating guy. I had an amazing time talking to him, and I hope we can meet up and get on the bikes and share a beer soon. Uh, we obviously share a lot of the same outlook on life. So now, without further ado, Ben Garwood. Hey, buddy. Can you hear me? I got you. How's it going? Yeah, good. Let me just make sure. I, I am a bit of a tech mong. <laughs> Believe me, I couldn't do this without the help. There you go. Nice. Uh, what's in the background there? Uh, the bar? So I'm in my shop. I've got a shop here in Hereford. Um, it's kind of a bit like my HQ. Okay. Like. Is that where I see all the and pictures of the motorcycles and everything? Uh, yeah, yeah. And then uh, obviously it was a Queen's Jubilee. So we um, we went a little bit. I love a little it. bit of town on the on the Union Jack. <laughs> I love it. I love it. That's Thank awesome. You. Oh man! Well, thanks for taking the time to do this. Mm. Hey, thanks for the invite. Of course. Yeah, uh, Billy gave me a shout and said that um, you'd be interested in having a chat. And um, yeah, let's do it. Yeah, man. No, absolutely. But uh, yeah, that, yeah, that we got connected through Billy Billingham, who uh, obviously is on that the the show and has the books mm-hmm. and and all that. We had a great conversation together, and uh, then connected us. But you're busy. You've been a busy guy. Yeah. You have books out there. You have a uh, YouTube show podcast going on out there, talking to interesting people. Um, you got these different the the shop behind you, motorcycles, and then everything you've done leading up to that. But uh, you're yeah, a busy right guy right now. Uh, you, I think you must be on absolute fire at the moment, aren't you? <laughs> it's a little busy. Yeah, no, it's yeah, fantastic yeah. though. It's, uh, you know, the show is out now and working on book it, yeah. six and uh, yeah, it's uh, it's been go, go, go. And then this podcast and I have another one where I break down each episode, kind of go behind the scenes of the show with the showrunner yeah, and another seal buddy. So have that going on, but it's a, uh, yeah, it's a fun well, I was sprint. talking to some friends of mine yesterday, some, uh, uh, some SBS guys who've worked with uh, Dev Gru and a few others, and and they commented and said how um, uh, Chris, who played obviously the lead character there, the way he moved was absolutely on point. And you know, I mean, absolute credit to the gentleman. Granted, you know, he had a bit of a lead up before with uh, Zero Dark Thirty right. as well, so a little bit of help there. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's that's obviously if you're getting that sort of feedback. Granted, you are your own background yourself. But if you're getting that feedback from guys who are serving now, that's good. Yeah, no, that's really what, when we started out, when I sat down with Chris and Antoine Fuqua, the director, uh, that was at the forefront of their mind was that uh, we wanted to make something that an operator could sit down on the couch, grab a beer, watch, and at least know we put in the effort to try to make it as good as we possibly could for them, not for critics, not for Hollywood. Of course, there's always going to be a couple of Hollywood elements here and there because you're telling a story visually, but uh, that someone could sit down on this, on that couch and say, Hey, look at, they got this mindset, right? We can tell that Chris put it, put in the work to try to do this weapon manipulation correctly. Um, And it's interesting. uh, You know, we're a little nervous about that because you never know until it goes up. But then the texts well, I'm getting from guys at Development Group and at, at CAG, at, at, at Delta there yeah. uh, that are texting me about it, like they, we, we accomplished that goal. I mean, they're sitting on the couch yeah. and of course, yeah, there's Hollywood things here and there, but the texts that I'm getting from those guys, you know, uh, yeah. and that's what was, that's what mattered. That's what mattered Yeah, absolutely. Us. And I think anyone from our background would understand that there's got to be that element of Hollywood to make it a story because otherwise it's been spent most of the time sat on a pan waiting for a job, right. you know, that's how it would go, but um even there's some small detail in there that guys who've been on the jobs would know that and i think it wasn't personally for someone who is always quite conscious about opsec i don't think it quite went that far and and i thought that was actually i thought it was a massive testament actually to, to the work that you guys have done there on that so yeah well done you know um i think it's very easy these days for people to try and be so edgy they're actually giving away OPSEC mm. and actually I think there's a way you can do things that still makes entertaining but you're still getting the point across and looking pretty professional at the same time so yeah it was mega oh, really man. thank you thank you Neil Some people- I, binge, I binge watched it actually nice. I, just, I just went in and blah. Yes. Oh, I love it. I love it. Yeah. It's interesting. Some people, you know, you hear, Oh, it's a little, little dark, a little violent. Um, you know, did Chris really have to kill that guy or pull out his guts? 
haven't heard anything like that from any operator. <laughs> you know, zero, yeah, yeah, but, no comments like that from an actual yeah, operator. Yeah. So <laughs> I, I think I think also you know there's there's an element I I think uh, you're the same I'm sure as a father um, I've got my, my daughter actually over my, my shoulder oh, now. Nice. Um, I, I think it was funny when I when uh, my daughter was very young and then as her personality sort of came on board the sort of overwhelming uh, sense of protection that I had. It's, it's amazing that every single one of these scenarios has gone through my head of like, you know, you, you basically have taken the film taken came at a right point of where, you know, in my life, where it's just every scenario is going through your head. So yeah, I think it's on point. And certainly for, for us, I think there's, there's that element of vigilantism and taking law into your own hands that I think is very, very interesting. Yeah, I think yeah, every cool. every operator has at least thought about it once, you know, yeah, kind, of, yeah. kind of like the like heat or something like how would we rob a bank if we were going to do that yeah. with our team? Like, how would we pull that off? You know, or if this well, happened and I had to go on the run and I had to go vigilante mode or I was going in the dirt anyway and I'm taking people off this list, uh, how would I do it? And so I think people yeah, have thought you know, about they're, that. They're really good questions as well, Jack, because actually as a learning and as, as an education point, when you're looking uh, we did it a while ago um, when we look at understanding the orders process and the estimate process. It's very easy for someone. Um, I have an analogy I use quite a lot of the time, uh, and it's the, the, the tradesman craftsman analogy. And the, the sort of person who joins special forces needs to be a craftsman. They have to be a lateral thinker, someone who can think out the side of the box, work on a black economy and understand that they don't always have the assets uh, around them. Then you have the tradesmen, you know, they still get into our units, but these guys are people who need structure, uh, they need a template and they follow guidelines and often they're quite lost when they, when they, uh, when they work outside of, mm. of that close knit bubble. So when we were looking at education uh, before uh, for our guys and development, instead of giving them a, a military problem, we would give them a civilian problem. Mm. All right. You know, and they try and put a moral side of it, which is what you've done there. So the moral side of it is someone's killed you, killed your family. You know, yeah, that's justification. I'll do that. You know, or something's happened to your best friend. He needs money uh, for this medical stuff. He's not going to get looked after. He's been fucked over. How do we look after our guy, our, our buddy and our team? So they put this sort of most like justify why we're doing this. Mm. Uh, but then what you do is you use the same estimate process as you would do. Um, but obviously you civilize it. So what you're not doing is relying on, you know, assets that are already in the wire, stuff that's going to get you burnt, stuff that's going to give you away. Um, so actually it's a great way of looking at problems. Still, you have the tradesmen in your patrols and your units that will go straight back to, yeah, I'm going to breach through the wall. You're not, mm. you know, no, you're not. You're not going to breach through the wall because that's straight away giving away you know, what you are, who you are, what you're about. And then you've got other guys who gives them a chance to think about your cover stories, your cover plans, your, um, you know, where, where, where do you get your kit and equipment from? What's mm -hmm. your, what's your escape routes? You know, what is, you know, what's your, your backup plans, your, your Kazabak plans, et cetera. So yeah, it's really cool. It's a, uh, it's a great way of getting guys to think outside the box is to give them a different scenario, but you're still using the same estimate process. Uh, and on that, Jack, I think really, I think we can put the estimate process into pretty much everyday life, yeah. really, of, of understanding the environments and, and, and what we're doing to everything is still an estimate, you know? Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. And you're, it's, uh, it's solving problems, creatively solving problems, uh, looking at a battle, battle space, understanding it uh, as best you can, and then applying your skill set to it to capitalize on momentum, identify gaps, uh, adapt. Yeah recognize mm -hmm. what the enemy is going to do to adapt to you. If you do this, mm -hmm. uh, you know, four dimensional chess type of a thing. Uh, but, uh, and I love doing it now on the written page, um, because obviously the stakes are not nearly as high. Um, but then I get to think about things and, and not, uh, you know, in a theoret theoretical sense. Yeah. But things that I didn't have to deal with when I was in just because of the time. So let's say, yeah. I mean, I'm thinking about in the pages of these novels, all right, someone's traveling under alias. Okay. 
what if they traveled under uh, an alias another time or their real name? And now we have facial recognition technology that didn't exist in the way it does mm-hmm. today in 2001, two, three, four. Okay. Now what? Now I've pulled into a room and you're getting, okay, why are you traveling here on this passport with this name? And now here we have this facial recognition technology that's saying 99.9%, this is actually you. Uh, I have some questions for you here. Oh, and for your companion over here, who you're traveling with, whether it's a male, yeah. female, whatever. Uh, and is that the weakest link that they're now going to blow your story? Yeah. Absolutely. And I think, I think on that you don't have when you're writing I, I'm you know I'm trying to do something slightly different I, I'm actually writing a graphic novel I uh, saw that I, I heard you talk about that on Instagram or somewhere I, I saw that uh, somewhere I just started yeah so the idea is to is to do um I I want to I want to praise the real heroes. You know, I want to praise the the boys and girls who've done real stuff. I'm talking all Five Eyes community, the guys and girls we worked for, uh, worked with and for all over the place. Um, but I wanted to tell their stories in a completely science fiction vein. So obviously we're not giving away secrets, not giving away identities and respecting that. But at the same time, having a lot of fun with it. And I know that I'm going to get to a stage where where you've done, where I want to get that realism and I want to get those details to make sure that it's credible in the way that we, we're keeping a standard. Um, but at the same time, I want to have a lot of fun with it and make sure it's completely outrageous. Yeah. But uh, what I was getting at was um, for you, you, you really are working on your own. You don't have uh, necessarily the luxury of a load of enablers, a load of J2 guys, comms guys, everyone else who's on that estimate to support you while you write your own, while you're writing your mm-hmm. plan. So you then have to try and remember, you know, is this right? Yep. Is this how I do it? <laughs> is this, you know, are these details correct? Is it in the right order? And what am I missing? What are the gaps? Because you know full well you're going to get the armchair critics. <laughs> Yep. Who won't see it for what we said earlier? That what it is is good entertainment. They'll go, oh well, actually, you, know, you haven't done fuck all anyway. Uh, I don't know, yeah. you know, and and that's what you're going to get. So you understand that. Do you care not overly? But that still drives you for your perfection to ensure you do a good job. Oh yeah. Cause everybody can now reach you today. I mean, the good part of that is I can engage, I can thank people on social media for taking a risk on me as a new author. And I really love to do that. Uh, cause I wake up just full of gratitude every day for what, uh, what people have done by picking up the novel and telling, telling a friend. Um, but at the same time, I mean, you, you're it's today you step out there and it's any kind of art whatsoever, any kind of subjective, uh, medium. And, uh, whether it's a sculpture, a painting, a graphic novel, a novel, whatever it is, uh, and you step out there and then everybody can shoot arrows. Uh, back in the day, let's say like when we grew up, you had to put in the work as a critic. I mean, you had to get, get hired by a magazine or a newspaper or something yeah. like that. Um, and then you had to write a review. A yeah. <laughs> and you had to put in some work, put in a little bit of effort. Uh, today yeah. you don't have to put in any effort whatsoever. You can just sling yeah. that arrow. Uh, but that's just the battle space in which we're, we're operating, but you're well, right. I, I, I actually had a conversation. I had some guys in, I, I do, I, you know, still, uh, support all the guys and girls I work with, including a lot of the the firearms teams uh, from the police uh, uh, and such like. And I love that community. I'm glad that I I left on good standing um, and I had a good run. I was a, a pretty mediocre SAS guy, to be fair, in all things. But I had a great time. I had a good credibility in, and I left doing what I enjoyed at a point that I got out at the right time. So I mm. wasn't um, disgruntled. Um but, you know, I was talking to some friends of mine that, you know, like you, I've, you know, this whole social media thing's barely new to me in the last sort of three, four years. And to be critiqued online, it throws you, even though it's by someone who you have a zero respect for mm-hmm. or have any or knowledge of even their existence. It's amazing how it can actually throw you. And it, when you sit back and, and go, actually, what a load of shit. Mm-hmm. But it's because it's so new to you and you're like, you're, and, and certainly for yourself, you're putting so much time and effort into what you're trying to create. You're, you're, you're not, it's not desperate that people would like you for it, but the hope that they would enjoy it. So when you get those critiques, it, it, it's quite painful. And if you think that's people like you and I, 
how is that affect you know kids mm, you know I or know. these other people whose life is on these platforms you know exactly no it's, it's so tough world. for those kids very sad world it yeah. is it's so tough when my wife and i sit down on the couch and have a drink at the end of the night you know we're like we talk about this quite a bit just how tough it is for these kids growing up today because it is it does for me it, it occupies bandwidth so i see something and it's just even though you know the person it, it, whatever they, they have not put in the work they've not put in the effort they have not they just sling the arrow and you see it and even if you push it to the side it still took up a little bit of bandwidth or whatever even if it's just an instant and sometimes it's more than an instant and then you know you can't even respond or say anything because that's what yeah. they want so you can't and often it, it gives them it gives them the validation so mm -hmm. what you don't want to do is you don't want to uh, acknowledge these no. people because they're certainly not sitting at your level so you don't want to acknowledge them but it's such a such a strange and foreign world even though this is a relatively new world, but it's mm -hmm. still a very strange and foreign world for people like you and I that really almost hid away from from this this oh, type yeah. of thing. Oh yeah, I mean, I never had yeah. a never had a Facebook, I never had Instagram, I never had any of that stuff until the lead up to the first novel when I realized that being an author is more than just writing. I thought I could just hide up here in the mountains and write a book and send it to New York and start the next one. That was my vision, but yeah. it became once again looking at the battle space, taking a breath, evaluating, and then realizing that that's not the space that I was about to step well, into. No, it's you, different you, now. You've got to remember, you're also this is why we created this. I created this place. I was actually still serving when I set the business up in, in, in my garage in the army quarters. And I, I knew I, I have a natural flair for networking. I can network, I can problem solve. And at points in my time in the regiment, you know, one moment we call it, you know, you're, you're number one on the T earns, you know, you had a busy job, you're, you're doing stuff, you're contributing to that estimate, you're at the table, you've got a seat. And that's what we all join for that chance to have responsibility. And, and then obviously, when those jobs finish, you know, those jobs drop off. Uh, let me just hold this for a second. Yeah, yeah. We got That's a visitor in the back there. Hey, there she is. Ah, uh, it's awesome. Hi. <laughs> What's happening? How are you? Awesome. Awesome. Well, that's difficult. <laughs> See, that's bad drill straight away. I've got my comms on in the background. Eh? Hey. <laughs> um, it's, it's the shop phone. I probably should have got it. Yeah, you can answer it. We can always edit it yeah, out. No, Take the call. You know, yeah, you yeah. Right, if it where's, where's, where's my kit? Where's my gear? You know, like, <laughs> um, yeah, anyway, so, so uh, yeah, I can't remember saying, but essentially, yeah, I set, I set the shop up uh, in my garage. And um, the issue I had was, and we were working with good brands, you know, um, Black Rifle Coffee and uh, a, a number of other really Really good brands that we were working with um i got in with these brands because of our background because we have shared friends mm -hmm. but to sell it online it was a real struggle and mm -hmm. what i was really quite licked out about uh, jack was um people online can pretend to be whoever they want to be um so i was competing in a world if you think about it, a few years ago there was a hype in everyone doing t-shirt companies and coffee companies etc um and um uh, I needed something to give credibility behind who we were as a brand. Mm. Uh, so I went to bricks and mortar. We went to this place. Um, and, you know, we um, the, the company is called HR4K, which stands for uh, HR4 being the, the postcode of, of my old guys. And it's an anagram of four kilometers an hour, which is the speed at which we, we go over the, the mountains. Nice. But I didn't want to go, hey, I'm murder, death, kill, you know, I'm a blade type thing because I was still serving, but I wanted something to give us that mm. to say, listen, we're not a bullshit company that's pretending to be something else. Um, you know? Oh yeah. No, that's amazing. Still so, there? Yeah. I'm, I'm here. Oh, there we go. Okay, cool. Yeah. Sometimes it might, it might oh, glitch yeah, every sorry, now and again. Uh, that's just part of the, part, yeah, of, part of the deal. So, so yeah, so we build these, the, you know, the bricks and mortar and, um, and what we found is actually we end up creating a really good community. We we create people who want who shared a very similar values to us, uh, work, contribution, family, uh, etc. And those real conservative values in, in the true sense of the word, you yeah. know, like as in contribute contribution into community. And this opened so many doors. And at that point, when we started to take off, it was like probably time to leave the day job. Oh, interesting. Go, in, go into this. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, it, it's brilliant. It, it, it's almost created its own space. Um, and we don't really, although we support veterans, it, I, I believe it's, 
it's bigger than that. And I believe nice. that there's many civilians who share exactly the same um, ethos and, and moral standing as us. So really, the, the SAS side of what I've done here is really to, to show this is my credentials, this is who I am, this is the standard at which I'm sitting, um, which is no real different to, to that, that father who's running two jobs to put food on the table, you know, for his kids, you know? Yeah. So it's brilliant. It's started to evolve. We meet really good people. Um, and, and the nature of the space that, that we've got here, I'll see if I can just sort of show yeah. you around. Yeah, I want to check um, it out. Nice. Hey, there you go. So, uh, you know, we've got a gym in there. It's You can nice. literally ride a motorbike into the place. I love it. Park up. Get I a love it. Coffee, what bikes do you have, have in there? I've uh, got some Indians, Enfields, um, nice. a little Honda. Nice. Uh, cafe racer. Cafe racer type. Yeah. Love it. Love it. I got a couple yeah. downstairs. I just got that uh, uh, R9T GS uh, 40th anniversary BMW down there. A little big for, nice. you know, cafe racer type yeah, thing, yeah. but it, it looks like a, you know, scrambler ish, a little big for scrambler. But uh, so I got that. Of course. And you've it, got some good roads up there as well, especially up around you, where you are. You yeah. Got, got some, some good really spots. Good got some good spots. You know, I, I do. When my wife and I went to uh, to Sturgis a uh, long, it's yeah. geez, a decade ago. Uh, and I actually wove that in to the first novel just as a you know character development tool for my my main character but we went out to Sturgis but we flew I must admit we flew to Sturgis and uh somebody out there had a, had some bikes for us and they actually had a house right over there's a national cemetery as you come into town and he had a house up on the hill that looked over the national cemetery um but it was beautiful they had so much rain the year we went so everything was green and those roads were amazing and beautiful and I will definitely go back one day but they had a uh, road king out there for us so we, so that was what we uh, we rode around on and had a great uh, a great time but i love bikes but i have a list of them but i don't know i think i'm starting to collect them but now i just can't there's no time to ride them yeah. so but it's uh, the same i mean i i've got a i've got a, a land Rover. i've got a soft top land rover an old uh, nice. 90 um one of those is on my list yeah it's it's mega mate all canvas top um it's done really well it is loud babe isn't it um so uh, you know that is me trying to be a rock and roll dad driving the kids to school and then if i get five minutes it's then get on the bike but yeah. like you said mate you, i'm literally making excuses to oh, i need to pop down the shop yeah you know yeah. And a great, you know, what I love about the bike is that, cause even in the car, you know, you, you, uh, I guess I can set it so that I'm driving and it doesn't, you know, doesn't take a text or, or, you know, phone doesn't ring or, or whatever else, but you're always so busy all the time. You just toss the phone in and you're going and on the bike, there's no option to answer that thing. So I just yeah. put airplane mode, you know, as I'm doing all my stuff, you're kind of taking that little bit of a breath, much more so than yeah. jumping in the vehicle, a regular vehicle, you know? Um, so I'm as part of my process, I'm putting my phone on, on airplane mode, making sure everything's all set, checking the tire pressure, doing all that stuff as part of that. And then I can get on. And that's one of the few places today that, uh, that no one can get me. And I love yeah. that. I love that it's about escape, the bike. It's escapism. There's, mm -hmm. there is something, I used to live really close to camp when I was in and I'd finish work. And even if we weren't at a busy tempo, which we normally were, I would, I would still be, I would still spend most of the day talking to people, getting stuff done. And even if that's in there, having a brew with someone, it's still, you know, I needed time to decompress. Mm -hmm. And so I'd get home, my kids, you know, were with my wife. So my wife wanted time to talk. She needed her decompressions. I needed 30 minutes on the couch, just not even thinking about anything. And I really envied those guys who lived a little bit further. You know, mm. those guys, so you can get that time. Mm. And for, for me, bike, bikes are about escapism. And that's very much what we created HR4K for as well. You know, the aesthetics in here doesn't look like work, mm. doesn't look like, you know, home. It doesn't look like all that other shit. You can come in here and just feel like a rock star for uh, however long you want. Have a brew, catch up with a mate, don't even talk to anyone, do whatever you want to do. Come in, watch if there's a band playing or rehearsing, you know, do, do that sort of stuff. And I think it's massively important to get that decompression time yeah. for everyone. Yeah. Um, and certainly I'm the same. Because I've created this space, I'm not necessarily getting my decompression time here. Yeah. So for me, it's about right. getting on that bike. Yep. 
You have to, you have to. I used to ride into to work at SEAL Team Two in Virginia Beach, and we had a, a core group of us out there that that rode. But one of the guys is actually who I dedicated my last novel to. Uh, Mike Goodbow passed away uh, recently, and uh, in service to the to the nation. And um, we used to ride our bikes, and I had a fat boy at the time, had it had it tricked out, and uh, I wish I can't believe I sold that thing, but I uh, wish I still had it. It was a two thousand three, I think fat boy. Um, but I love that thing. And it was, that was, you're right. It was the decompression piece after work, heading home. And there was just something about it. And I just love, yeah, yeah. love, love the bikes. Uh, there's, there's, a, there's a good charity out of, uh, Bragg, uh, coast to coast. And mm. I think you may have seen them out of Sturgis. Um, they, um, they do very much about bike stuff as well. They do a lot of bike meets and, and everything else like that. And that was something, I know a few of my guys had gone over and met up with the coast to coast guys, mm. Uh, and enjoyed that and obviously we, we share a, a lot of those those friends um over at Bragg as well so yeah I mean it's it, it's uh it, it's another brotherhood isn't it you know or sisterhood whatever you want you know it's I mean we one of the good things I we we run bike and car meets here and there's something really important about having something like that and it's not necessarily the bike or the car it's actually an excuse for people to talk yeah, it's, a, it's an excuse for people to come and just, oh, I like that. And then you get talking about the bike, but are you really talking about a bike? No, right. you're not. You're right. conversing with another human being, Yeah, you know, and just being human, you know, socializing, yeah. interacting. And I, I think actually what we wanted to achieve here, Jack, was probably – I'm running a business, run it. I've got, I'm making money. I want to put food on the table, as we said, and, and, do, and have those nice things like bikes. But at the same time, you know, we're in a really fortunate position to do something we love and do a bit of good and probably hit a, many of these things at root level, ground level. Mm -hmm. um, you know, because actually, regardless whether you're, you're kicking doors in, um, you know, moving satellites and moving a high tempo job up there, or you're, I know, I can't think of anything else. You know, you're working, working for the local council, you know, digging up roads. Many of those fundamental issues that we all suffer are going to be very same, Yeah. you know, uh, and we're all got that same shit kind of going on. So, and actually, if you just spend your time with the same people, you're now creating another institution instead of being in a community and you're probably compounding the issue as opposed to realizing that, you know, We've all got these 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 issues going on, and certainly here in a rural community, you know, there's a lot of issues with farmers, mm. farmers with, with this, and and obviously with the the place levels and and everything else. So that I think um, we are very fortunate, certainly from an SF background, that we are the bad guys, bad guy. You know, we we um, we know what we were going into, and we knew the threat, and we understood the threat, and we could process the threat, where a lot of other people they don't see it coming. You know. Yeah, so, no, uh, yeah. I love that. The cool bad down. guy's bad guy. That, that's fantastic. Uh, yeah, over here in, in uh, we have Fieldcraft Survival here down the street in uh, in Utah here in Hebrew, Utah, and they get mostly like an overlanding type community uh, together. So land cruisers yeah. and Jeeps and and that sort of stuff, Tacomas, and they meet up, I think maybe once a month or maybe it's every weekend. But once again, bringing people together, community talking. Yeah, you're talking about the tires and wheels uh, and suspension or hey, are you having this interaction and building yeah, community yeah, and, and, and not virtually, you know? No, uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> so that's nice yeah, being just, off the uh, phone. As long as no one actually talks to me about details of motorbike, because uh, I, I've said this. I mean, I uh, I got asked if I'd uh, do an interview for Land Rover Monthly magazine, and I said, look, to be fair, I would, but I'm I'm not a purist. Yeah. You know, I I don't clean my machine. I I like it dirty. As long as the engine turns over, I'm happy. You know, same as my bikes. I don't fix them. I yeah. just ride them. <laughs> you know? Yeah. But just so you end up having conversations with people who know far more about oh, yeah. things than I do. Oh yeah. No, I go to the subject matter experts on those sorts of, of things. It's important, just like with sniper stuff or whatever else, it's important to know your capabilities, but also your limitations. Uh, both of those things are, are important and, uh, whether it's sniper stuff or the bikes or, or whatever else, but, but me too, I like my trucks. I like those dirty, uh, you know, not yeah. worried about that at all, but the bikes I like to clean. That's the one thing that I, that I, that I keep clean is the, is, is the bikes, uh, mostly probably so that I can, uh, notice if anything's a little different in there and like, uh, okay, that looks different. Now it's time to bring in that person that really oh, yeah. knows what's this is what's going on right here um uh, but how long were you in how long did you spend in uh, in the uh, military i did tw i did 23 years in the military wow. i i joined the paris parachute regiment 
Um, it was quite quiet at the back end of the 90s. Um, so we came in at the same time for, then about, I came in in 96 boot camp, and then uh, Bud's January 97 for SEAL training. Yeah, that's it. So 97, I was in Depot Para. Um, I did about three years and I, I transferred to, to the REMI, which is our Royal Electrical Mechanical Engineers. Huh. Um, nothing was going on. There was no deployments. It was the same no. sort of rotation through Northern Ireland, which was, was, it was pretty boring, really. You know, the did you do one of those with the, with the pairs? Yeah, I did a couple of them. Yeah. And, um, but by that stage, everything was kind of settling down. Mm. Uh, the only players are out there were just the little shits justifying mm. why they can, you know, smuggle and uh, mm. deal drugs. And Interesting. Everything else by putting some form of court. But yeah, it was really quite mundane. Uh, so I looked to transfer. I went and uh, got a trade as mechanic, um, which I was terrible at. Uh, <laughs> and then I did only like two years. I transferred back. And I transferred back in uh, straight after 9-11. Um, and that's where things started heating up. We started getting on tours. And I, I had a massive fear of missing out. So I, I came back. I went back to the same platoon, same section, in the same unit in the in the Paris. And we've got a saying, uh, uh, in, America, in America, they call them legs. Yeah. And... Uh, in the over here we call them crap hats huh. and uh so i was called a i was called a, a crap hat by gotta, my power edge mates i'm gonna write that down uh, i might be able to use that in a novel at some point yeah i was yeah i was called a crap hat by my um power edge mates and then i was called a failed crap hat by my remi mates so i really couldn't i really couldn't win e either way um we did a few tours had a had a bit of fun in the early iraq days and then i went to a unit called the Pathfinders, mm. which is a reconnaissance platoon for the um, 16 Brigade, which is our airborne brigade. Uh, did a, a, a few years there, did a, a quite a cheeky Afghan tour in 2009. Oh, wow. um, a lot of long range mobility stuff, heavy okay. weapons, uh, marking uh, tactical landing zones, uh, heavy drops, you know, uh, resupplies, really good stuff. Um, and that's the Pathfinder. Um, so what is, uh, what was the training like for Pathfinders and did, did it, uh, was it the same unit before 9-11 as far as training as after, or did you guys move into that mobility side of the house after 9-11? No, so it's interesting that we would probably, and I'll make a bold statement like this because I was in the mobility troop in, in the SAS. I would argue that we were probably ha were more operation, mo had more operational experience mobile. Mm mobility than than even the SES wow. at that time and it was because we had a number of uh, afghan tours where we were predominantly long range recce okay um so the selection process is cheeky now i i went on selection back in 2001 when foot and mouth was on we went up to a place in um west virginia i think mm. it is something okay. like that uh, because foot and mouth was on, we needed to go to somewhere else to go and um, to go and play. Oh wow! Um, so we went abroad. I mean, that was many years ago, and um, it was horrendous. It was uh, you know, it was pretty hot, <laughs> pretty sticky. Um, you know, there's snakes and fucking bears and all kinds of shit <laughs> all over the place. Um, the um, then, but what I, I struggled with as, as for my body type was actually my own endurance um, uh, at the time. And I really struggled with, with that. I was fit. I played a lot of rugby. I oh, was, nice. you know, um, uh, Carly Vasky, very, very fit, yeah. you know. But actually, when it came to my endurance and stamina, I, I kind of struggled. I hadn't really hit that peak. Um, so I didn't do well on my first selection. And then I, I went back to the Paris, as I said, I went to the Pathfinders. Um, and by that stage in, in my life, my body had got to a point where now I was better at longer endurance. Mm. I was, I was able to do that. I trained better. I spent a lot of time doing like long time on the legs, less weight. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so Pathfinder card was very good for me. And, and okay. the Pathfinder card is very much different to the SCS selection. You know, yes, you're doing lots of navigation, um, but it's a lot of heavy, Hello, baby. Take care. Um, it's a lot of um, uh, fast, heavyweight speed stuff. Yeah. Um, with a load of other bits and pieces thrown in, which is sort of long range kind of stuff. Mm. 
and I think it's what my body needed to make that change uh, that I had. And, and in, in, in that as well, we do a lot of patrol skills. Uh, we go back to the basics, which I, I think we're losing these days culturally anyway, because we just don't play in the woods as much as kids. Mm. And now we're having to find these skills or create these skills as opposed mm. to being brought up with them. Um, so I did a I did a while in the Pathfinders. Amazing experience. Did my uh, Halo freefall course uh, in your neck of the woods. Nice. And um, yeah, had a great time. Uh, and then it was time to go on selection. Okay. And what, I think what I needed personally, Jack, was I <clears throat> going back to my point earlier. I think as as a craftsman, I needed I needed a seat at the table. I, I needed to feel like I was contributing. I needed to feel that um, you know. That actually, I have a brain, and I want to try and understand the problem and get involved in, you know, manhunting and, and mm-hmm. you know, doing this stuff. Um, uh, and I wasn't too bad at it, you know. And you know, I was I was able to do it, and I was able to think of alternative ways of targeting. Certainly, in environments that are quite um, restricted and um, contested. Mm-hmm. Um, so yes, yeah, so, though then I managed to get myself on selection. I unfortunately broke my leg on selection. Oh. I put a feeling through my leg. I fell off a, a 55 foot building, respirator, body armor, the lot, and then I put my femur through my leg. So no way. What stage um, is uh, at what stage that is was that? On, that was right at the end. So luckily I was an ex pathfinder. So I'd done the the halo courses and the jumps courses. I'd done a lot of OPs. And I'd done enough on selection for them to be happy with me. Um, and so, yeah. I felt so at, at the very end, so you'd already done the rucking in the first part. Yeah. You'd gone, done the jungle yeah. stuff. You'd done the escape and evasion. I was on the floor when I, I came off. So I came off my figure of eight, literally, as I came oh. off. And we had like these Blackhawk carabiners for kit. Mm. Somehow the Blackhawk carabiner got mixed up with my uh, DML uh, carabiner. Oh. And um so as I, as I went over for my third descent, you know, doing the old embassy stuff, you know, uh-huh. through the window, respirator, body armor, helmet, lot. Um, I came up, I wasn't even on the rope and I started, I just felt, and as I was, I was falling, I sort of grabbed the rope, which kept my head up and uh, my body kind of accepted oh. that it was going to take the impact. And I, I, when I landed, my femur went through my legs. My right leg is now uh, an inch shorter than my left with a uh, limited range. However, this was in 2009 when the surgeons and the consultants are at the top of their game. You know, they're yeah. seeing this shit, you mm-hmm. know, in Afghanistan. Um, they're seeing the transition of uh, of an enemy with uh, the money to buy high explosive to an enemy that was running out of money, now uh, buying HME type explosive, mm-hmm. which is more of a pushing charge, as you know. So it's even more devastating. And the consultants are like, no, no, he's good. No, he's, he's good. Um, wow. So the doctor was like, yeah, if the consultant says good, then let's badge him. Um, they worked hard on me. I had about a year rehab. And then by the end of the year, I was doing UK CT stuff. So the UK mm-hmm. team stuff, a lot of, uh, you know, the shield and, and a lot of heavy kit, a lot of fast roping, mm-hmm. all that sort of stuff. Um, and, um, and that was enough to build up those small micro uh, breaks in your bones okay. to start strengthening it. Um, yeah, okay, I suffered a little bit at the time with, uh, as you can imagine, um, um, with uh, heights, yeah. <laughs> as you can imagine I would do. Uh, but obviously, there's one worse fear than heights, and that's your mates. Mm. So you don't want to look like a dick in front of your mates to ensure that you still go over that ledge, you still jump out of that plane. Oh, yes. And um, so, um, yeah, uh, I was then on ops within 18 months and we were good. So, and then I had a full run on every job we did within the squadron up until uh, my last few years. So, oh. um, I think personally, Jack, I achieved everything I ever wanted to achieve within special forces and certainly my military career. Mm-hmm. I left as a staff sergeant and I feel very content. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, and now these days uh, I'm in a job where on a Friday, I look forward to a Monday. It's kind of, <laughs> that's awesome. No, I love it. Yeah, I yeah. love it. So it's winning, but, um, yeah, it was, um, yeah, it was good. I, I, I've got, a, I'm so grateful. I, I still support the regimental association very much, uh, because how grateful I am for them to ensuring that they gave me the chance. Mm-hmm. Um, 
and and they looked after me and my family very very well as they as they do everyone so um that's why i want to continue to carry on looking after special forces and uh the stuff i'm doing with ground hammer is very much part of that homage to uh, to the group as opposed to uh, exploiting it right there, which can be which can be done which obviously you and i wouldn't do that so that's right yeah, that's cool. uh, man i love that's what i mean what a crazy path that's amazing that uh, i mean what a break on that fall Ugh, that stuff and you know, know. it's very natural for people to be uh, uh hesitant of going near a ledge and why because going back in history uh you had ancestors that were a little more careful near the edge than maybe other you know because if you got close yeah. and you fell you would die um yeah. so it's very natural to uh for us i think it's it's in our dna to kind of like you know, not uh, to be a little skeptical of those things, but uh, man, that's crazy. Yeah, it's funny. When, when I landed, when I landed, I'm sort of rolling on the floor. Oh. Uh, I had, I think 10 mils of morphine is all they put in me until they got hold of the ketamine. Tourniquet on me because it was a, a femoral bleed. Oh, um, with, jeez. With, so my femur actually, so my femur came through my leg. Uh, so it's sticking out. Where it's yeah. Split. And then it severed my patella tendon, which is obviously the tendon that holds your kneecap to your quad. Jeez. Um, and um, so I'm lying now, I, I, and I felt incredibly nauseous from the adrenaline dump. Not okay. actually the, that morphine, amount of morphine was, was insignificant. Yeah. Um, and I remember my instructor, who's a good friend of mine, and he said, um, right, everyone, because obviously the whole of selection was sort of gathered around me, like, you know, yeah. one of them was got his knee in my groin, you know, uh, uh, yeah. holding the bleed. And, right. And uh, he's like, right, everyone, put your hands up. Who thinks Ben should redo the jungle? Right then. <laughs> the last thing I was like, you fucking dare. Uh, this is so fucking close. Um, yeah. So, um, hey, that little no, humor, you know, as we know, you know, humor is an important part of uh, yeah, dealing yeah. with uh, and, and stressful that situations. Made your whole world. But uh, yeah, they, I got some ketamine thrown in me. We, they flew me straight to the hospital, straight from the, the training Jeez. ground. And uh, they looked after me amazingly. <laughs> and it was at the height of 2009 yeah. where the amount of, um, injuries were going through okay. uh, the, the the hospitals, yeah. um, and it was it was amazing to be there and and be with a lot of those guys that certainly you know weren't as fortunate as I was when. Yeah. You know, right. When you look around, right. yeah, I've heard that from, uh, from a few people looking around and seeing who they're, who's, who's next to them in the, in the hospital bed and look at that. Yeah. Way. Yeah. Man, tough, tough. But, uh, but you made it through the, uh, the, the, the ruck phase in that first part, no problem on this, the second go around. And then is it off to the jungle after that? Yeah, that's right. So, um, so, so selection really isn't the hills. The, the hills is really, in my mind, is a screening to ensure you are fit enough. It's a health and safety test to ensure okay. you are fit enough and you can navigate in arduous terrain. Because when you get to the jungle, you're straight off the plane, you're straight on that beach and you're running. You know, wow. there is no climatization. Hey, guys, just <laughs> ease into off. this. Yeah. Yeah. Let's get down by the pool. There's none of that crap. You are straight down. You know, you're in a world of hurt. Yeah. And, and that's the point is, you know, selection for us is um, it, it's self, it's a self-motivated course. It's not a course mm. that you get thrown onto. It's a course that you will have to be there. Right. I'd argue, as I said before, about 80% of us are the sort of craftsman types. 80% of us are people who probably aren't going to be missed by our old units. Uh -huh. we, we're the sort of people who ask questions. Uh -huh. You know, we, we are oh. very alpha in nature. Mm -hmm. um, we don't always work well together outside the unit, but certainly we do work well together inside the yeah. unit. Um, so selection is self-driven. And then so when you're in the trees, it's uh, which is what we call the jungle of the trees. So once okay. you're in the trees um, and you're now, you've got the option, just like you guys with that bell, You've got the option to jack. You've got the option just to just to walk. And when you start seeing your buddy walk, and you tell me if that's no difference when you guys are on that beach, if you start seeing your buddy walk and you see, and that's a path of least resistance. Mm. And then you start thinking, uh, well, you know, things aren't going on well at home. Mm. You know, it probably won't get any better if you go home. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, she, she's worse. already made up her mind, buddy. <laughs> Might get um, worse, yeah. Yeah. And uh, so, yes, it's all about self self motivation and and then obviously digging deep so selection start starts looking at you then mm. 
it doesn't look at you on the hills. It looks at you then and it says, look, you know, can you work with others? Can you work when you are absolutely in shit state? Yeah. And when we say work, we're not asking you to work so we can find out if you know we're watching you type work. We're, we want to know you're working when no one's watching you. Yeah. We want to make sure you're, you know, we used to call them moss collectors. So when you have to build a model pit in the jungle, you'd have a number of people, we'd all be building the model. And then the shit ones, we used to go, can you go get some moss? You know, wow. so we can, we can build the foliage. And you know, those moss collectors are the ones that are. I, oh, think I love that. There. Man, I'm getting so much good stuff here. Moss yeah, collector. Yeah. I have never heard that before. I love it. It's kind of like we call it like a mouth breather. You know, you're not yeah. really, you know, someone, hey, if you want to give them a good, hey, watch the palate. Here's your weapon. You know, don't, yeah, yeah, don't leave until it. you're properly relieved of duty. Um, you know, them, yeah. uh, but maybe not the the best critical, creative, logical, uh, hardworking yeah. guy. So, thinker. yeah, they, they um, <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Yeah. They're, they're, they're there. They're the people we keep on selection to keep the numbers up. So when it comes to camp, <laughs> yeah, there's a few guys, Hey, we need, we need to lift a heavy object. Hey, you, <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah. that, that, that's Someone's useful. Take the ammunition to the range and, and, you know, and in the jungle, as you know, these are like 300 meter hills oh, covered in trees, you know? And, um, yeah, it's amazing how you climatize quite quickly. And again, that's part of it. If you think about, uh, the, the, the units we're serving in, uh, you know, you could be in another another country within. You could be in another country within. You know, a few hours. Yeah. You know, working out of your belt kit. You know, you you don't have the privilege of climatization mm -hmm. and and everything else. So, you know, they want people who can adjust, adapt. Right. Um, I think the the issue going forward. Uh, so that that's the trees, and then you you do a number of you do you do a lot of things like IA days, which is obviously you contact drills. There's a lot of stuff there that wears you down. Um, and then after the the jungle, you come back, and then you're probably one in ten are passing. You know, out of the jungle, one in ten is making oh. it through that jungle phase. Wow. Yeah, yeah, probably about one in ten, one in ten, something like that. And everything's um, trying to kill you down there. I mean, it's not, it's, it's a, uh, it's a tough environment to, it's to a operate. Different, it's a different jungle to to the America's jungles. Uh, it's a, it's, I, I personally thought it was an absolute privilege. It's a beautiful jungle. Mm. Um, you're off the beaten track. You're not seeing anyone. Yeah. You're not on the ridge lines. You're absolutely in the thick of it. It's clean. It's nice. You, you you know, without being cheesy, you adapt to that environment very yeah. quickly. You can smell everything. You can smell that box of shit that you've got in the, the back of your burger. And you can, you know, you can smell the guy next to the ammonia off the guy's, you can smell everything, you know, and there's all kinds of creatures. Now, after a while, you know, you start, you know, your patrolling gets better. You become quieter. Your drills become slicker. Mm. Um, you know, you, you don't move at night in the jungle. Um, well, you certainly didn't then. Obviously, now with NVGs, it's easier to do certain things now. But certainly for the drills, it's about learning to operate without without the um, you know the niceties. Mm -hmm. um, so after the jungle, obviously, was it, was it always in the same place? Was it always the jungle phase? Always, or has it moved around uh, in different no, locations? No, it, moves, it moves around. Uh, it moves around. Uh, yeah, uh, I, I won't say obviously where it is either, but um, it. it uh, it moves around in the same region. Right. Right. But, but obviously, yeah. was it always a part of SAS training or did it get added at some point along the way? Where did yeah, it come so in? It's, I think, I think really off the back of we, the SAS was formed. Uh, yes. Okay. We, we were formed out of North Africa. Um, but we really cut our teeth in, um, in the jungles of, of, uh, Malaysia, you know, that's where we really cut our teeth. Mm -hmm. We came into our own, then mm -hmm. um my squadron logo is is of a, a tick mm. you know um uh and that was me um that was actually meant to be from um the guys picking up ticks and, and from in the jungle and then there's b squadron's got a bear paw uh from a bear that they found on a camp attack back in the sort of 1950s and stuff. wow the truth of the matter is the the a squadron's tick isn't a tick at all. It's actually an, uh, a crab. It's an STD crab that the blokes got after whoring it. But obviously, <laughs> they thought it was so funny that when they came back and their new girlfriends and wives were like, "What is that tick? Oh, it's a, it's a tick that we got." From the jungle. They didn't really want to go. It's actually an STD crab. We just thought it was so funny because everyone got crabs from whoring it. Oh my god! Now you got our unit logo. But, wow, um, I love it. 
but these guys they're old school you know these yeah. guys are absolutely the selection was was operational tour back in those days wow. um and it's still it is the thing that divides you the jungle as you you probably know is 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 where it absolutely divides the man is the jungle because you've got nothing you know it's hot it's humid um everything's dirty everything's you've got to administrate yourselves you've got to hydrate you've got to feed you've got to stay clean you know it's it's a difficult environment to work and then on top of that you're probably against an enemy who was born there mm-hmm lives there they know it better than you do so it's a it's a difficult environment to work in um yeah so after after the the jungle we um we then go on and do uh, a number of things i, I won't go too much into yeah, that yeah. No, that's a good that's an interesting part your next part there is an interesting one you know i'm sure people can find it online but it's uh you know there's some interesting things you guys do after that jungle phase yeah yeah exactly you know I, I don't really want to be the one to spill it but um but what i would say though and and i don't know if, if you'd agree with this uh, or it's something you identified because as you as you think you and I soldiered over the same period of time is um, about 20, you know, 25 years ago, we were very, very conscious of our going back to the original conversation. We were conscious about our own digital footprint. Mm-hmm. We were conscious about how we were seen electronically <clears throat> um, and our arrogance over the last few years has sort of led us to um to to rely heavily on on tech um and the analogy i use is called the dick pic it's a dick pic so it's where officers continuously want information from the front line and they want a high resolution and they want this dick pic and what is a dick pic a dick pic is a piece of information that's completely pointless that's only going to get you in the shit so why <laughs> fucking send it um so you know why do we constantly want this need for uh, for information on the front line and and you know you can see that in the latest release of what you've done is, you know, we're identifying our own enemies on their electric, le- electronic presence. So what's saying that the people who are sponsoring these proxy forces were against are not just doing exactly the same on us. But when it, the shit hits the fan and we then have to work in a contested environment, we no longer have the, the luxury of relying on technology. Or even if we have technology, that technology still needs to be deployed. So working those environments, you still have to go to absolute basics. And on those basics is working on your belt buckle. That's mm-hmm. you relying on your field craft, the absence of the normal presence of the abnormal when it comes to patrolling. It comes to all of those things that you know are absolutely wrong about what's going on in that environment that you are in. And we learn those skills by playing hide and seek as kids. We learn those skills by trapping, by catching and shooting rabbits. We learn those skills on playing on those in, in an urban environment by playing on the building sites and playing, you know, kick the can with your friends or whatever. And those skills, I mean, was it Roy's Rangers? You could probably bring it back to that shit as well. Rogers Rangers, yeah. Those, Rogers Rangers, sorry, I apologize. Yeah. Those, those skills there are what, is going to take you forward and ultimately keep you going. Um, So this modern age where we've got boys and girls who aren't playing in the woods as much, they're not out. Well, the knock on effect is we're going to have to recruit them. They're our next recruiting pool. We also saw it, uh, Jack, in Afghanistan, where that generation who were probably two or three generations after you and I, have a fob mentality you know so they worked out of these fobs and because they're working out of fobs they were they they created routine Mm -hmm. Uh, they were had restricted in the areas of operation they set patterns Mm -hmm. well you know when we shoot when we fish when we hunt we do that based on patterns that our Mm -hmm. quarry is setting Mm -hmm. so we spend the whole time just laying ourselves up and our arrogance led us to that. And these boys and girls, these poor, you know, these poor young boys and girls who are doing exactly as they're told. Now, in 2009, when I was in that hospital and I was talking to these guys and I was saying, you know, what happened? You know, and I was lucky. I came from a unit that did a lot of Northern Ireland patrols. So mm. we, we, we were used to patrolling, you know. We, would, we wouldn't cross over at vulnerable points. We would never, you know, stick to tracks or paths. And every single one of these guys and girls, they've said, well, you know, I was, I went there every day. It was fine. Or oh, I yes. patrolled around this route all the time. I was on this track. I was on this road. Yeah. I was like, oh my fucking God. 
you know, and, and it's not their fault. Yeah. It's not their fault because they didn't grow up that way. And it's not their fault because their commanders weren't educated that way. So what they, what we saw is this fob mentality of reliance on technology, um, um, not being able to patrol. And then ultimately organizations like yours and mine would eventually have to recruit from that pool of people. And that's where selection had always failed in the past because selection doesn't teach you how to soldier. It assumes you are the best soldier from your unit going forward. Right. It hasn't got the time to teach you. It's not yeah. about that. It assumes you've got those skills already in fans. So I'm not saying that this is an issue because I certainly are addressing it, but it's, it's certainly a, a cultural issue going forward. Oh, yeah. You know, So I think that's something that, that, um, that, that uh, it is being addressed uh, and, and finally being recognized. Yeah. Um, but it's crazy. We're, we're now looking at countermeasures that we took for granted 25 years ago. Yeah. Oh, right. You know, maybe we should look at a different type of comm system. We did that 25 years ago. Yeah. No, it's amazing. The adaptation that takes place. And for you guys going to Northern Ireland, I can only imagine uh, the observation skills that would come come into play because, well, you owe it to yourself, your family, the guys to your right and left in that patrol. Um, and uh, that sixth sense um, coupled with observation skills. I mean, there's a reason that uh, that we're here today. And that's because we had ancestors that also they didn't get too near that ledge. Uh, they were good at hunting. They were good at fighting. But they also listened to that gut instinct. They listened to that sixth sense sense which is a real thing yeah, absolutely. Um, but all those patrols yeah. in northern ireland i mean I, I, i've been in northern ireland and i've been to a couple bars up there but uh I, but you know in my mind growing up in the 80s and reading all those books about northern ireland and that being you know kind of a focal point of terrorism in 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 the 80s um when things were written about magazine articles and newspaper articles and, and that sort of a thing would often reference what was going on up there but uh i can just imagine being on these these patrols it's very, in uniform. It's, it's very difficult to fight any form of, uh, you know, the, the terrorism or insurgency where mm -hmm. you don't own the ground. You can't dominate. This was the thing with the fobs. You, uh, fobs, yeah, we're in these fobs in the middle of some shithole it's so we can dominate the area. You're not dominating the area if you go, keep leaving the area to go back into your fob. Yeah. The same as Northern Ireland, we kept leaving the ground to go back in the ground. Mm -hmm. And at the, at the time, I mean, they're civilians. The same as Afghanistan. We had this idea we were fighting the Taliban. Taliban was just was just a way uh, to suit really uh, the narrative that many of our officers are trained, which is the red coats versus the blue coats. We were fighting a populace, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, and obviously it's a great narrative for our governments to justify that there is a solid enemy as opposed to a you know, a generation, a populace that you're fighting who are only just, you know, protecting their crop and their own interests. Yeah. Um, and, and how do you fight that? You can't fight that if one moment they're picking up a, you know, a, a hoe, a rake, a, you know, whatever, going to work, and then they're pulling out a weapon system. You never know who your enemy are, you know? Yeah. Um, and it's very difficult to do that unless that you are working in a uh, against an enemy that is uh, a conventional enemy. We're not. We're fighting guerrilla warfare. Yeah. No. Expeditionary yeah. counterinsurgency is obviously um, very difficult. Uh, you guys in Malaya have one of the best examples of doing that um, in, the most, in a successful way. Um, but we lose these lessons over time because yeah. I think we, uh, uh, you know, we think in terms of, yeah, it's well. You, you, you know, Jack, that the, the only way to win a war is through pure attrition. No war has ever been won by getting rid of the guy at the top because you can always replace that. You win right. wars by pure attrition. With someone and smarter because guess what? I just saw my boss get whacked in a certain way. Guess what I am now. Now I'm smarter. Uh, now I figured, yeah, yeah. okay, I saw that. Now I'm going to evolve. So essentially, he, if you do that he forever. He doesn't have an army. Yeah. He doesn't have an army. He's got nothing to move. So you you move lots of people off the battlefield and that's how you win wars. And, and the only way to win that is to be as dirty as they are. And obviously, politically, there is no appetite. Uh, you tell me that, um, you know, your lead character in Terminal List, you telling me that, you know, that character could win that fight if he went conventional. No, you know, he, he became a dirty bastard because that's, that's right. what it needed to, to, to do what he needed to achieve. And, and ultimately that is the way we do it. And that's why people like you and I, you know, mm. we do what we did. That's what I was uh, really exploring in that first book was uh, turning him into a terrorist, turning him into the insurgent that he's been fighting for those at, at that time, 16 years, um, but taking those lessons and, and I 
I talk about that physically as I describe him growing the beard, growing the longer hair, raiding the uh, the armory of what is now his en- enemy, which was his armory, uh, taking claymores, taking rifles, all that sort of a thing. Um, so he's evolving into this insurgent and then using those tactics that worked so well against us overseas on home soil against people, you know, uh, when I think of it at this level, uh, who have been sending young men and women to their deaths for, you know, now 20 years, but back then 16 years. Uh, so it was very therapeutic to, uh, to write. But it's interesting when we talk about, you know, we always want to take the head of the snake. You know, you hear that all the time time, go after these guys. But, you know, what it was the last 20 years shown us is that, hey, we were essentially evolving these organizations and we're speeding up that evolution of these organizations um, because you're getting smarter. So just by default, uh, they're learning and evolving and adapting without the gigantic bureaucracies that we have typically in our militaries. And so they can evolve a little quicker. But when you see that lead guy, that head of the snake get cut off, well, guess what? Now we evolve. So it's a really yeah, interesting problem. And set. also, these guys are often figureheads. You know, the, the real people, I, I saw it, and I, I won't talk into details here, but I saw it. I saw that the main players in some of these mm-hmm. shitholes weren't the one that looks like the warrior leading from the front. That guy was a figurehead. The real the real enemy was those those old men in white dish dashes sitting in the back. <laughs> uh, no different to the old men in white dish dashes that are, or white suits that are sitting in our backs. Very similar. You know, and those those figureheads are the ones who are leading and inspiring the men and uh, you know, to to run that jihad or run that that conflict. But in fact, the movers and shakers in the background, and we saw it there, were moving millions, moving millions, uh, you know, making an absolute fortune pushing their agendas, pushing what needed to be done, and then these figureheads. So we we focus so hard on trying to remove these figureheads and these people because politically it's more digestible to the voter because we've seen it, we've seen it recently in American politics. It's easy to hate the man. What you're not addressing is the problem <laughs> that's underneath the man. But politically problems. it's easy to hate the man. So so that's what, what we um we often do is we 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 target the man rather than the, than the institutions that often surround that, uh, you know, uh, and those institutions are constant. That's 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 obviously the, the problem there. But but what I mean is is um, it's very easy uh, politically to hate the man, and it's very easy to hate an organisation. So it makes it easier as a narrative when you and I are very aware of the complexities of a very four dimensional battle space that involves family, tribe, religion, state, prox- proxy, state, you know, there's so many more factors than simply the red coats versus the blue coats. Oh yeah. Yeah. I know. I talk about, uh, uh, some of this, you know, like the guys kind of behind the scene in my fourth novel devil's hand. I, I talk, explore that a little bit in there. Writing these things has been very, very therapeutic. And I want to ask yeah, you that, about that too, about what you, in the graphic novels about that therapeutic to write. But before we get to that, um, so you go down range for another six, seven, eight years, you're doing the job with the SAS, you're getting all this experience. At what time do you start thinking about next steps and next chapters? Um, that's a good question. So I, I do a little bit of advice for companies, have done over the last few years, and I always tell people that it's worth transitioning early. Mm-hmm. You need to be transitioning early because you are never more relevant than when, certainly for a soldier, than when they're in. When you leave, you're just another SAS guy. You know, you've got a small window to work with, but when you're in, you're building these contacts. You've got credibility. You've got a voice in the room. You've got the ability to influence um, and more importantly, you've got a lot of people surrounding you that want to support and help you. Mm. Um, and these people need to be remembered and looked after as well. So we have a number of benefactors that support us. They make sure that if something bad happens to us, we get first class medical care and our families are always looked after. And I'm very grateful for these people, um, as I know um the story behind some of the Winkler uh, knives and stuff, the, the guys who getting a lot of that as benefactors who support these mm-hmm. boys and girls. And um, it's making those contacts and trying to work out what you want to do when you leave. For me, I, I am driven by a medium of being able to create. Um, I am, uh, I suppose, by nature, an artist. I, I like, you know, music. I like art. I like, I like to create. And I think HR4K was certainly my medium to better create an environment uh, mm-hmm. and and be involved in something, and then use my ability to network to 
support other people and, and find ventures. Mm. Um, so I think that's what I did. As, as I mentioned earlier, I had a need to keep doing stuff that I wasn't necessarily getting that release at work. And that's what helped me drive my business. So actually, when it came to transition, and I left the military in uh, 2020, I took three weeks off. I built like a, a shepherd's hut in my garden. You're on the wheels with the shepherd's hut and the curved thing. You know, someone to live in at the end of my garden, a bit of a man cave. No real reason whatsoever. Just I, it's a bit like getting on the bike. Mm. Uh, it gave me focus. It gave me something to do to think about uh, instead of work or the doom of transitioning into civilian life and having to scrape around for cash. Yeah. Um, and um, and then I realised, yeah, it's all it's all good. You know, I'm a grafter. I'll I'll find work. I'll make sure it works. And and then I was good to go. But um, I always advise people they need to transition early. They need to be transitioning out of the military four years before they get out yeah i think it's good if advice you're prepared to work if you if you're looking to work for yourself yeah yeah and i think a lot of us are just because special operations in particular kind of uh it, it attracts somebody with that entrepreneurial type of mindset because you're a problem solver you're an aggressive problem solver you're a creative problem solver um yeah. and uh what typically a lot of us don't like about the military is that structure is that bureaucracy are those people who slow you down when you know what needs to happen and you can creatively uh, adapt and uh, but for whatever reason you're part of this larger machine that in many cases is wonderful because it also accounts for having an AC-130 gunship overhead and a Reaper or whatever it is um, but at the same time a lot of these things uh, slow you down and if you're a go-go pogo person you're kind of more apt to want to work for yourself at least I was I was well, you, not interested in having why, a boss ever again this is why you know this is I just uh, helped a friend of mine answer a question he has for one of his education courses. Um, and I think being a special forces, the difference between us and special, for, uh, special forces and the regular army is the regular army. Um, so certainly the SES is classless, mm. but we understand position and rank. Yeah. Which means gives us the freedom to think about the problem and focus on the mission instead of the process. Mm. Our process is often picked up by our enablers and our support units where the big army relies on process above mission because mm -hmm. actually mission will always be successful because the process will ensure the mission is a success because it's such a big beast. But you need process because actually what you have is people come from all different backgrounds, they join the military, and there is still, it's still based on class. Now, whether, you know, we've changed and our approaches to class have changed, but ultimately the foundations of the military is based on class. Mm. Um, and we saw this um, as you go through the junior ranks and class is replaced with responsibility. So where you're not necessarily given class from an, o rank, uh, an OR, another ranker, you're giving more responsibility, which means power. So what you have is power instead of class, which gives you a sense of belonging, purpose, and, and position. Mm -hmm. By having power means that they, the, the officer class has a grouping that does exactly what they need to do. And obviously through process ensures that the soldier will blindly go to war and do as they're told. Mm -hmm. We then look at the messes, the, the the warrant officers mess, the sergeants messes, and that is that is ultimately giving other rankers um, a, a sense of class by giving them mess and giving them a privilege. But still, they're not an officer; they're not mm -hmm. sitting at that level. I'm not knocking any of this. There was a reason why we created this structure is to ensure that soldiers go blindly into battle and do as they're told. The process is there to ensure that the machine works, the machine is well oiled. The difference is for special forces that, as I said, we need to be driven because we're incredibly reactive instead of proactive. We're, we, um, we, are, we need to be driven by the mission, not the process. And we are very fortunate that we have the enablers and support units and the friends around us to pick up that back end and ensure it's following in the same direction as us. You know, um, And I think you can do that when you leave and still have the same mindset by creating a team around you of people who understand your mission, but are far more skilled at doing those other jobs, i.e. like you and I talked about earlier, IT skills. <laughs> uh, you know, yeah. I even have a girl who works out to make sure I've got insurance. Nice. Uh, you Good know, for you. And, yeah, and yeah. My, it's important. And, that stuff is yeah, important. And my, and, my, and my fire extinguishers aren't running out of date and stuff like that. And it's not, it's not that I think I'm above that. I'm certainly not. I'm right. the first guy that's on the coffee machine and everything else. 
but I'm just not an admin guy. I'm, I'm, I'm not yeah. that detailed. And you do things that make you more effective and efficient, especially when you're running something like you are, yeah. uh, cause that's important. That, that's important. Yeah. And it's been a slow, it's, it's been a lesson I've had to learn because yeah. I haven't had the money to bring on the that right. enabling guys. So I've had to do it myself, yep. which means that I'm now my focus is taken away from my mission. Instead, I'm it, my I'm involved in the process. Yeah. So I'm finding my way is slightly muddled. But now it's, it's time to get there, you know? Yeah, they're very similar. I think we're at a very similar stage. Uh, I looked at this as a as a startup. As soon as I realized I couldn't just write in the cabin in the mountains and just disappear uh, and that I had to actually build a business, um, uh, well then I just did what I normally do and just look at the problem set and then adapt. But I looked at it as a, a startup in the garage uh, and that you have to do everything you possibly can. You have to have the best product possible. Of course, that's a given, but people have to know it exists and you have to build, in my case, a readership, uh, a viewership now that there's a, there's a show out. So you as a one man show, you have to do all of that. You have to do all the things that I had no idea you had to do. So the, what, all the things that you have to do budgets and advertising and marketing and social media outreach, all these things that any business has to do, any startup has to do. Um, but then eventually you get to a certain size and it is, you cannot continue to manage it by doing everything yourself. Uh, so now you have to evolve and figure out who to bring on these enablers uh, to bring on to help you stay focused on the mission doing what you do best instead of being slowed down by all these other things that you might not do so well and so i'm at that Ooh. same stage too i finally have uh, somebody an assistant to, to come in and start uh, yeah, and helping it's like that she has been mega how i mean how responsive is she well the, i don't know if i'm allowed to say a name on here but um well done. Oh, I've, nice. sent you a I've sent her a t-shirt. Awesome. Well. We can say Jessica. Is so you talking about Jessica? Oh, there, there she is, Jessica. Jessica's amazing. Know. She's an ironclad yeah, she and she does yeah, all that. She's cool. amazing. Does all this stuff that I could never do all that. Just the scheduling and sending out a Zoom link. I have no idea how to send out like a Zoom and link. And at the same time, the whole, although we, you know, we obviously there was process driven there. It still felt very, very personal as well. Oh, awesome. So well done, Jessica. Awesome, Good Jessica. Job. Thank you. Yes. Uh, so building the team out, uh, especially with people who do the things that you don't do so well, exceptionally well. Um, so that, I'm at that stage too. So I feel like we're kind of at the same, at the same stage, uh, as far as our evolution post military life. Um, and I started think I knew I wanted to write, you know, very early on in life. I wanted to join the military. I wanted to serve my country in uniform, specifically as a SEAL when I found out what SEALs were when I was seven. But then I started reading all these books about age 10 that my parents were reading. And I knew that one day I would write these same type of thrillers. So I knew that was after the military. So as I started creeping up on that 20 year mark and realized, hey, I've, I started enlisted, then I became an officer. And now I'm not going to tactically maneuver guys on the battlefield ever again. Uh, if I stay in, yeah, I'll come back as a commanding officer, which a lot of people sounds uh, like, uh, sounds, I don't know, important or whatever and it is but you're back there in a tactical operations center and you are managing and you're allocating assets um you're not out there with the guys which is what i came in to do to kick those doors and and do that combat battlefield tactical level level leadership and so it was time to go it was very clear to me my family needed me we have a special needs middle child who needs 24 7 full-time care so it was very clear that it was time to move on uh and i knew exactly what i wanted to do which was right so about that last two years for me but i identified it about four years out because that was my last, um, Iraq or yeah, Iraq deployment and came back, went to the schoolhouse to our buds as the operations officer. Mm -hmm. And then I'm like, okay, time to get out. Okay. I have a couple of years left in here. Uh, and then as I crept up on that 20 year mark, time to write. And so it sounds like you did something, something similar because you identified that yeah. you were going to get out and then you started building, building this business. And how did it, how did yeah. it start? It, well, as I said, I think, a few things fell in my lap. I was a bit of a kit pest, being an ex-pathfinder. Hey, it's all right, come. Sure. Yeah, it's all right. Um, the, uh, I was a bit of a kit pest. I used to build kits, so I built some uh, belt kit, you know, uh, webbing. That yeah. Sort of stuff. Were you sewing it? Were you sewing, like, nylon uh, webbing? Yeah, yeah, we started selling it. Um, I didn't necessarily have the right team around me at the time, um, so unfortunately we lost a lot of really good opportunities mm. with that. Uh, the reason why I built the belt kit is because the training squadron at my place asked for a new belt kit. And I was a kit pest, so I said, yeah, I'll build it. I built enough sets for all of those guys nice. to wear in the jungle. Um, but I just had um, a civilian team that just didn't see the vision of if I'm, they're like, well, why should we make belt kit for the SAS? No one's going to see it. I was like, mm. I couldn't believe it. You know, you're like, if the SAS are wearing your belt kit, everyone's going to wear your belt kit. 
you know it was it was it was i called it the fcsr there's a there's a there's actually a website called soldier systems mm-hmm. uh, run by a very cool bloke uh, called uh, eric something okay. rather uh, soldier systems online and uh, he he managed to put my kit in there it's called fcsr fighting clearing standing and uh, reconnaissance so it was a belt kit that i could turn into any form of patrolling and still do it um and um we sort of fell out and I really had to concentrate back on the day job. Um, so but I still felt like I wanted to do a few things and a few things fell in my lap, a bit of procurement. We started helping anti-poaching teams in Kenya, Tanzania oh, wow. uh, by providing the kit. I've done something recently doing the same thing uh, with Ukraine uh, by um, identifying high-end kit that they can afford so they're mm. not getting ripped off by these uh, charlatans. Interesting. And I did the same for uh, the anti-poaching. So yeah, we took a cut I was editing and take a cut off the Ukrainian piece, but we did take a cut off the anti-poaching to obviously pay for yeah. the logistics and everything else was done through that. Um, so I started enjoying this sort of entrepreneurial thing. And then we came to heads with the, the business partners. I still felt like I want to do something. Now, me and a lot of my friends from Delta uh, and such like, and your old units, we wear a lot of these T-shirts. We wear a lot of this gear like uh, Black Rifle Coffee, Rogue American Apparel uh, and stuff. Uh, and I thought, well, there's a market for this. So I started importing this stuff into my garage and then selling it online. And we did quite well. You know, we had the monopoly of sort of high-end US SF type brands here in in the UK. Um, And that's kind of where it really started from there, um, really. Uh, And then obviously by creating that name, we we created a reputation, which meant that other opportunities came out of it. Um, But I'll be honest with you, uh, Jack, it was actually encouraged. It was encouraged by my own unit and my own commanders Um, of what I was doing because what I did uh, wasn't a security threat it wasn't um, it wasn't uh, contestable with what's going on work you know it didn't have no sort of uh, unethical overlap Mm -hmm. conflict of Um, interest type things and that's right that's the word yeah and um, what they said is we like your entrepreneurial spirit because actually you're getting shit done so I was able to use the skills and my networks and people I was I was getting to meet, and I was able to put that into uh, some of the other programs I did, like uh, sort of UAVs and signature management mm. and a few of other projects that I was very lucky to be involved in. Um, by using the same methodology I was learning in business, I was bringing into the military, and then ironically, now I'm taking the the estimate which I learned in the military now in into business because obviously previously going back to that point is previously i wasn't reliant on that process because all i had to do was produce the goods <laughs> now that i'm a, a trading on my own i need to ensure that process is play is in place yeah. to, to to give us that thing so it's a bit of a big roundabout mm-hmm. um but as i said you know uh I went from, um, you know, we're earning some good money and, and I'm just about doing okay now. Um, I'm happy. Uh, the kids are happy. And, and as I said, on a Friday, I leave work on a Friday and I can't wait for Monday. You know, it's, yeah. it's good. Can't ask you more know, than that. That's uh, that's amazing. But it puts you know you're putting in hard work. So first you start out making that belt kit. You move on to, to t-shirts, importing some stuff in, selling around Europe or UK focused. Uh, uh, yeah, all over. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, the, the issue often is is what we I struggled with is um, the the idea of this business is incredibly attractive. It's very attractive because it's very chilled. It's very relaxed. It's got kind of a cool front edge to it. Um, but often people aren't prepared to do the graft that you need to yeah. ensure that you do that. So you can't create an environment that's chilled unless there's people in the background working their tits off to ensure <laughs> yeah. that it works. Seriously. Um, so yeah. um, you got to make it look easy. That's part of the key. You make it look easy. The best in the world make yeah. it look easy, uh, which yeah. which fools people into thinking, oh, it's natural talent or they just got lucky or whatever else. So it's kind of a strange thing. So if you're looking at people, uh, whether it's a professional, somebody in professional sports or whatever else, and they make it look easy and you think, oh, they were just born with that talent or, you know, somebody's yeah. successful or, or in they, business they or he just a, got lucky. Yeah, exactly. Somebody you know, did this, yeah, you know, whatever. Um, but you, uh, but that is the, that's yeah, part of it. Cause it it's, keeps, it's not always, it's always clear cut. Yeah, no, but it's like, it's like selection. It, it's like that. It's like making sure that everybody is in, is physically fit uh, by hiking uh, through the beacons. You know, they're they're like 
Okay, well, not everybody's making it through that. You're not ready. You're, you're not ready for jungle phase. You certainly aren't ready to, to join this unit. Uh, Same I, thing, I you're self-selecting out. You know, you're self-selecting out by I, thinking, oh, that's easy because that guy's making it look easy. So I'm not oh. even going to start. So it's tough because you got to realize that there's something else going on with that person that yeah. you're looking up to. Like there's well, some I, had, I had one guy say, oh, the reason why your business has been successful is because you're in the SAS. I was like, you, you could have done that. Do you know what I mean? Nothing stopped you from doing selection. Mm. And I don't think that's an easy path. Mm. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> All you have to do, yeah, is yeah, yeah join the British military, oh, yeah, uh, yeah. pass selection for the SAS, one of the toughest selection courses yeah. ever ever devised, uh, go yeah. to war, uh, you know, yeah. come back, put in 20 some odd years dealing with the personal and professional sacrifices and and then and that you do, and then figure out how to start again, essentially, and build a business. Yeah, pretty easy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah but you only got that because of that. It's like, <laughs> you, you, most of these people have had exactly the same opportunity as me. It's just whether or not. We, are, we all, a lot of us are very lucky that we we can choose our own path. You know, Exactly. So, yeah. That's it. We have the freedom to make our own choices. That's That's it right there. And we can appreciate what was sacrificed so that we can do that you know there's that, that yeah, gratitude absolutely. piece to it as well uh, but then how did it evolve so from that from those t-shirts that you were selling to leaving the military and then building what you have today what was um, that what was I, that evolution I think, uh, so i think if i'll be honest with you it, it got to us uh, got to a stage at work where um i just didn't feel uh, i i knew that i would get posted and promoted and the nature of the job is you don't always get posted and promoted based on merit. Mm. The guy that can take over your job could probably undo all the work you've done, mm. um, or you you could go into a job that you just don't have a natural flair for, but because it's the military, people have to get posted and they have to get promoted and they have to get pushed into these jobs. Um, so I went into, uh, into a job I didn't really enjoy uh, for a couple of months, um, and, and then I was on a Friday, I was only there for a couple of months on a Friday. I thought, you know what, I'm going to, I'm going to sign off. I'm going to sign off. And I went on on the Monday and, and signed off. And the, the regimental careers officer, he was actually signing off at the same time. He was like, yeah, sure. We'll, we'll, we'll get you out early release. Um, so the decision, once I'd made that decision, it was a case of, right, I've made that decision. Let's get on with it. Yeah. You know, and, and that's it. And I think that's, I, I am lucky, Jack, that I have led my career selfishly in the fact that I've gone and done what I have wanted to do. And I'm very, very fortunate that I've had an incredibly supportive wife who's allowed me the freedom to do that. And we talked yeah. about this the other day, and she's a good girl. She, um, you know, with the kids, she's had the kids, you know, and she's allowed, and that's allowed me to go on tours and go away with work and not have to worry about anything back here. And then with work, you know, like now, you know, I'm, I'm here talking to you, yet she's come from work early, picked the kids up, you know, gone and done that. So I am very, very grateful. And I know that if I didn't give her a shout out on this podcast, I'd be in the doghouse. I hear you. Well, I'm gonna have to do the same then because it's it's very similar uh, in that, you know, people don't think, you know, they think about us out there in Iraq and Afghanistan and other places, and they don't realize that, hey, we're next to our best friends our teammates, we have a mission. We're solely focused on that mission. We're not worried about the the leaky roof or changing the diaper or paying a bill. Uh, we are, yes, someone else is doing that. And most of the times that's our wives back home. And yeah, yeah. my wife did that for all those 20 years. And, uh, yeah. and then now today, even building, building a business and going all in on this, um, she's taking that risk with me. And, and never once has she, never once did she ask me to get out. Never once did she ask me, uh, Hey, you, I think you're working too hard on this. Uh, isn't it time to, uh, you know, to, to g g time for dinner, stop what you're doing. No, it's like, we're focused on building this out and I'm going to write these books and we're doing this podcast and, uh, we have this merch line and I'm writing scripts and I have multiple different things out there in Hollywood now. And I have all these, you're juggling all of this stuff and she's right there, but still guess what I don't do today. I don't pay any bills. Yeah. I don't do any of that stuff. She still got that. And that is a huge job. Uh, yeah, same, so I'm same so lucky, I think when so you're lucky. younger, when you, when you are younger and you're in, in those units, you're so swept up by the excitement. You're so swept up in being, you know, being there, being with your buddies, being on those jobs, uh, you know, living your best life. Um, the, there is part of you that's slightly selfish, 
you know, mm -hmm. because actually you're making the most of that window that you've got and doing those incredibly cool things that sometimes become very, very normal, which is, you know, kind of blows your mind when you think back at it, you know, some of the shit you do and it's just bizarre. Um, but yeah, you lived a brilliant life and the whole time back here. Um, I, um, you know, you get phone credit when you go away. I, I never actually... Um, I never used to phone my wife very often when I was away. A lot of guys did, they were phoning all the time. And I didn't because I didn't really, first of all, I, I didn't really have a lot to say to her because, you know, we were doing these ops and the only thing I was involved in was those ops because I certainly wasn't going to be talking about that sort of stuff. And also the same time is that I didn't really want to worry her. Mm. You know, I didn't really want, I wanted her just to get on and have some sort of normality with, in her day mm -hmm. without having to worry about the phone ringing unexpectedly because I just yeah. wanted a chat or something yeah. else, even though I know she'd pick up. But so there was, there was that, but certainly I think we were kind of selfish and I'd probably argue you probably were as well. You were living that life. You're having a great time, but the whole time we were uh, lucky to have those rocks. And I think that comes with a certain amount of, this is a bold statement, but I think because you are the individual who chooses your own destiny you chose the trade you took you're the sort of person who's probably going to choose a good woman mm. you're not going to be married to the first thing that touched a dick in Fayetteville mm. you know you're not going to be doing <laughs> that you're going to it's this is going to be you know you're going to meet someone who's similar same mindset obviously there's anomalies and bad luck in some of these situations but often you know we're picking we're picking good people because they're the people we want you know, with us, you know? Yeah, no, I think I mean, maybe there's a little bit of luck in, in there, uh, but who knows, but, uh, oh, yeah. also, yeah, I, mean, I, absolutely. I feel oh, very well, fortunate. Well, I also grew up with well, very strong, well, uh, strong women around me. And so when I wrote this first novel, it ended up having strong female characters and it wasn't because I thought, Oh, I'm, I need to put strong female characters in that because it'll, you know, do X, Y, or Z. Like, no, I was just telling a story, but it very naturally had these strong female role models because my mom, my grandmother, my great grandmother. So I knew all of them growing up and I heard those Ooh. stories about the depression. Um, both of my great grandparents were born in the at end of the 1800s. Like, so I had all these stories and it was uh, very impactful uh, on me. And so I think that naturally made it into the storyline, um, which didn't hurt when it got to Simon and Schuster, because when I walked into that building, uh, primarily female. Um, and, but I didn't think about that ahead of time. I, I had no idea. Um, and but then also forced. with, it's that's not forced. forced. Exactly. It's very natural. Yeah. But then also with the scripts, we have some good lines in the, in the show with, with Chris Pratt, stay off my list. I am justice. We got these great lines in here, but I think the most chilling lines and the most powerful come from females. And there's this one, uh, Catherine Dyer, Dyer, she's amazing, but she, uh, she is very, very, her role, her screen time is, is short, but she is James Reese's wife's mom. And she's sitting I there. It. I know it. Yeah. And she's like, do what you need to do. And this the way she says it is just like chilling. And I love that's, that the that, females have the line. best roles. Green yeah. Line. Yeah. I love the females have the one. And then there's another one in the second to the last episode. And it, it is why I thought of it because of what you were saying. And it's James Reese is in his house and he's having these conflation memories. You're not sure what's real and what's not. And his wife is there and they're in an argument, which is uh, unusual. It's, I think it's the only argument you see them, them have. Yeah. And, uh, and she says, he says, Hey, I'm over there doing this for you. And she says, no, you're not. When you're over there, you're doing this for you. And it's like, yeah. and it's a, it's a powerful line, especially yeah. to those of us who have been down it's there. It's interesting because uh, I didn't even set that up there. I mean, that is, I mean, you, you, you know, you, you, there's some serious truth bombs being released on that. When we talk about OPSEC, I think the biggest OPSEC was probably things like that. Uh, by actually saying, <laughs> you know, what, what the truth of that is, why we are doing the job. Mm. Um, I thought actually one of the best lines as well, that the green light off the mother-in-law was brilliant. Mm. I thought also the best line um, was, um, was the quote that he was asked, what would your dad think about what you're mm. doing? So yeah, I think, a good forgive one. me, I'm going to misquote this, but yeah. he said, um, never drive 
um, a man to to, violence. If violence is what he has spent his life perfecting, something along those lines. Yeah. As a good one. I looked it up. I looked at it quite. I was like, whoa, well placed there. Well done. Nice. Nice. Oh, awesome. Awesome. I love that you picked up on those same things that, uh, that I did watching it. Um, but I love that the female characters got those most chill, the most chilling lines of the, of the show, of the series. I'm actually, um, uh, I won't disclose too much. I'm, I'm going in the same direction with the ground hammer stuff. Yeah. I want to ask you about that. Few conversations at the moment with some some people, which nice. uh, I wouldn't mind at some point picking your brain offline. But yeah, absolutely. Um, the I have so my uh, my characters are in there, as I said before, people I've met through the way. Um, you know, I've got in there. I've got Gurkhas. I've got Fijians. I've got I've got women. Uh, I've got all people from different backgrounds. And when I wrote it, it, it came so natural. There was no nothing forced in what we did. Uh, And when I went to uh, quite a large uh, uh, executive for a large company recently, it happens to be a close friend of a friend, um, the... That was that came out, and he said, "You know, this is it sits very natural in your story." And I said, "That's because they're people we know. These are Mm. people we know already. Uh, You know, the way I grew up through, you know." 80s, I was born in the 70s, 80s, 90s. This was never an issue. I never had to choose my friends. I never had to choose my friends. So I got some diversity in in my pack. You know, these people around us, and and I, I fall in with the people I want to be with. Mm-hmm. Um, so some of the characters are coming out with now. I'm excited about them because these are really cool characters that just happened to be different to a white Caucasian, mm-hmm. you know, and, 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 um, and they're incredibly, incredibly inspiring people. Um, so I like that. I like the fact that, and I think, I think certainly where society has gone now of forcing these issues, uh, uh forcing, uh, a gender agenda, uh, you know, enforcing these kind of issues is making it really difficult because it's almost restricting that freedom to write. It's restricting that thing. And then when you have done this, it's almost you're now questioning. I never questioned, you know, that my narrative. I never questioned who I spoke to or how I spoke to them before. But going back to my point about social media earlier, now I'm in this world where I'm thinking, right, I've got to, I've got to be conscious about this sort of stuff. Yeah, it's an interesting, luckily, interesting time, interesting, yeah. uh, you know, battle space to, to navigate, yeah. that's for sure. But but I think but, luckily, we, you and I, we come from such a diverse background anyway, that the, there's, no, there's, no, there's no issue. Yeah, I think just... I, I find if, it if it's, slightly, slightly insulting that, that there would be. Yeah, no, know? if it's natural... If it's natural and authentic, you know, I think that wins the day. Um, oh, you know, I think yeah. that that wins the day. But uh, for, for Ground Hammer, when did you when did you start working on those? Um, are they are they out? I think Jessica said they're in route to me, like because I because yeah, they're so coming from the UK sent, or something. Trailer. So what I did is I um uh so a few years ago I created a beer called Ground Hammer, and the idea was to put proceeds back into the Regimental Association for every can sold. Um, we then started getting into a number of bars and we had to put it on hold work and everything else was getting in the way. So it kind of sat there dormant and we came up with like a tagline spilling blood in the same mud since 1917. And the idea was to create a, a beer, um, that was a British, uh, traditionally British beer brewed with American hops. We were even looking at pilgrim hops to link it back to the association. Um, and the idea was to put proceeds back in. And then I was looking to do it on your side of the pond, um, to then put proceeds back into uh, my brothers and sisters associations as well over there. Mm. Um, and it was a way of saying thank you because when my kid was born, uh, he needed a bit of support. I didn't have the money. I was, you know, fairly junior rank. And straight away, without hesitation, the association put the hand in the pocket and the money was my bank account the next day. Uh, as I said, they also looked after me when I was injured. They ensured that my wife had employment and somewhere to live, et cetera. So I'm so, so in debt to them. When, to be fair, at that level, they could easily just palm me off and get another guy through the door. But yeah. instead, they they look after their own, you know. So I created this brand called Ground Hammer. So Ground Hammer comes uh, from the old gunship, um, the, Hammer, the C-130 gunship. And... The name Ground Hammer came from a friend of mine who I massively respect and was a bit of a um, an inspiration to me as a soldier with a similar background as me. And his nickname was the Ground Hammer. 
because he was equally as devastating as the gunship. Mm. Um, I was actually in Utah at the time. I um, can't remember where I was now, somewhere somewhere along that big, long, straight road that goes through sort of the, the sort of bottom end of uh, Salt Lake City. Mm. And uh, I was in a bar, and we were trying to think of a name for the beer, and my mate said, why don't you call it Ground Hammer? That's a great name. And I was like, yeah, sure. Okay, cool. Let's go for it. So we called it Ground Hammer. And then, as I said, we wanted that... Um, we wanted that um, homage to our friends that we've been spent so many time with, and, and that's why it is that um, spilling blood in the same mud since 1917, since you and I uh, joined forces at the back end of the First World War, and then we've been side by since. Yeah. Um, that kind of sat, as I said, on the back burner recently because of a number of other things. And the girl who works for me, uh, she said, why don't you bring that brand back out? So at Christmas, I thought, sod it, I'll... I'll um, I'll write a story. I'll, I'll put some more background mm. into it. And as I started writing, I was like, actually, let's just go a little bit out of out of the park here. And I, I came up with this idea of there's a backstory. If you go onto the website, you can see the backstory that I've written. And it's out there. I mean, we're talking about titans and planets and, you know, mythology. And the idea is to create characters um, that um, represent their inner warrior. So uh, Ground Hammer himself is based on two guys who were sadly killed in my unit called, uh, he's called Matt Lloyd, named after uh, Matt Tunro and uh, Lloyd Newell. Um, and his exploits and his sags are based on real events and real stories and real things we've been mm -hmm. involved in, but obviously done in a science fiction way so we don't give away those secrets, as, mm -hmm. I, as I mentioned earlier. Um, and um, each one of the characters, the Fijian, he is an operator, but in a underneath him, he because he's he's quite an old character. Mm -hmm. You know, these guys are, are incredibly old. They're like almost like Highlander type characters. Mm -hmm. Inside them, they've got that inner Fijian warrior, and that comes out. And the analogy I've sort of used is um, when in in a con in a contact, we um, we have this freeze, fight, or flight kind of mentality, and actually the moment we're in a contact and it goes noisy and the rounds start going, it becomes incredibly euphoric for many of us. Some of us don't like it, but for me, not that I like it, but I find myself incredibly calming once the rounds are now firing because I now have control. Even if I'm outgunned, outnumbered, whatever, I still have control because I now know where the enemy is. I know now what the situation is. So my inner, you know, soldier, that, that, that my training kicks in and I feel incredibly calm. It's like when you, a guy, you MMA or rugby, before that whistle goes, you're, you're, you're nervous. As soon as that whistle goes, you're in that zone. You know, it's nice and steady. It's calm, you know? Um, and the idea was that when these guys in the story go into battle, that inner warrior comes out, that euphoric kind of underlying warrior and all that that knowledge and expertise and muscle memory and everything else sort of comes out so that's where i kind of wanted to go wow. go with it um but because it's so vast and the story uh, expands such a wide timeline it allows me to go backwards and forwards it allows me to pick up different stories sub stories and then work on the different characters with, within that and just have a just have a bit of fun you know mm -hmm. and just kind of lose myself in it um so the comic we we're doing that because I think it's just something slightly different, certainly here in the UK. Um, and I think I can be a bit more express or whatever what I can be, you know, I can express a bit more in it through the visual imagery of that than I can yeah. do probably by word. Um, but yeah, I went to Comic-Con. I searched high and low. Went to Comic-Con. I found an artist. Oh, which one? Which one? Yeah. There's a bunch uh, of them now, right? Yeah, yeah, I went to the, I went to one in the UK. I found my enabler. I found like you, nice. or you are my, and then my brother-in-law, who's a superb paratrooper. Uh, so his his dad was a paratrooper as well. So my oh. wife has been surrounded by paratroopers. Oh, wow. um, he loves his graphic novels. So I get him to help me write the sagas. I write the backstory. I write the kind of the format and the, the sort of structure uh -huh. and I get him to write the mini sagas. And then, um, and then obviously I, I dictate those sagas around, uh, the, the overarching kind of vision. Um, and then obviously we got the graphic artist to, mm -hmm. to bring his magic. And then I've got another guy, which I should mention, Mike Oxley, who, um, who is the one, he is my Jessica. He is the one nice. who, uh, 
he pulls in and apologize, you know, that, that he is my just be here. Oh, so yeah, fantastic. Yeah. That's great. I can't wait to read these. I mean, I'm so excited. That's, yeah. I think it's such a fantastic idea. And, uh, and interesting when you said about, you know, this, this calming type of presence, I had this other podcast, uh, where we're talking with the showrunner and, uh, buddy of mine, Jared Shaw, who gave the book to, to Chris Pratt. And also he stars in the series as, as Boozer. Um, but we have a podcast called the danger close podcast and we break down each episode and we just did, uh, yesterday, the day before we recorded the, the episode for the, where we talk about the final eighth episode and we're talking about james reese on that boat right before he goes in the water and that he's knows he's going into it he knows he's out after what he thinks is the last name and uh there's this, this look of peace on his face and then in the middle of it as he's fighting he's up here ben is in this tower when that 50 cal and that in that lighthouse shooting and saying hey fbi's on you know fbi's arrived get out of there and he just has james reese has this just look of peace and he says you know i'll see you on the other side ben and he goes, but he's peace. You know, I love yeah. that, that calm. That's exactly it, it, what we it, just talked about. It's incredibly weird. I think for, you know, without sort of spinning, pulling up a, a sandbag and swinging, swinging the lamp too much here, but uh, I was always worried how I would be in my first contact mm -hmm. because I was always worried if I would freeze, fight, or flight. And it wasn't so much that I was worried I'd let my guys down or, or, or you know, I, I wouldn't do the right thing. Um, it was an incredibly uh, euphoric experience the first time because I realized actually I can work in this environment. Now I'm very conscious that at any point my brain can say, I don't like this and you can mm -hmm. switch off. So I'm very aware of that. But that was a weird feeling. I, I actually had a mal uh, 12,000 feet uh, at night on the canopy where I had, um, I had, I was caught up my canopy on another guy. So it was hung oh. underneath him about 12,000 feet at night. Um, and again, you know, I'm hung under a guy, my canopy's wrapped around his body, I'm below him and I'm going, you all right? He's like, yeah, I'm all right, cool, we're cool. Getting on the radio, yeah, we're good. I'm hung up underneath him, I'm at now, you know, 10 grand, I'm good, he's good, we've got one canopy, uh, I'm gonna cut away. Cool, I'm gonna cut away, you happy? I'm gonna cut away, we're good. And it was incredibly calming. What wasn't calming was knowing I was about to gift wrap him with my shoe right. and he was about, you know, so that was the no. So my mate was eventually like, "Can you get on with it, please?" You yeah, know, give me a little more time to deal with whatever's yeah. going to happen next. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He said, wow. "Get on with it." I'm, you know, I'm kind of so you know, cut away. It's good. I'm on a canopy, uh, you know, and I get to target, and um, yeah, it's cool. I'm fine. You know, there is no back end of that. You know, I'm, I'm I know I did the drills. The drills were good. Mm -hmm. I knew that what I need to do, and I think being able to process the situation and understand it rather than being tunnel visioned into that gives you that calm uh that you need as an operator to be yeah. able to do what you need to do you know it's um yeah it's drilled into you it's that muscle memory um but obviously you you know you need to better break out of that being tunnel vision so you understand um you know your situation awareness you know the yeah. everything around you so yeah it's uh I have no doubt that will probably come back on me sometime and I'll probably have a, a, a mental breakdown thinking about under, being under a canopy or falling off a building or some yeah, of the other crap. Stay, stay away from there. the edge of things, you know? Like, geez. I actually, I actually uh, abseiled off the Hoover Dam, which is oh my gosh. Had, like 600, whatever that is. Ridiculous. Wow. And um, I remember going That's over That's repelling the for anybody listening in the United States. Yeah. And I go over the edge and it was like, you're going to be all right? I was like, um, it's just like... Phew, straight i was like wow obviously when the weren't looking like, oh, fuck. <laughs> oh man Jeez. Obviously, obviously after like, your, yeah, your experience in a selection obviously. yeah i had been on i had been on the piss in vegas for a, for a few hours before that, so <laughs> probably a few things that calmed my nerves there you go um, but yeah you, you, uh, i think ultimately as i said you, you don't let the guys down and certainly you don't look like a pussy in front of your mates that's right that's powerful <laughs> motivator <laughs> powerful <laughs> motivator oh my goodness yeah how many how many amazing uh you know feats of a accomplished throughout history because of that right there just yeah yeah <laughs> oh yeah. man man and then oh, uh what's up with your youtube series you have a youtube series also where you sit down and talk uh, to yeah to so it's, it's a little thing that we're trying to push uh jack so uh we create a show uh called own it and it was about physical mental well-being and the mm. idea was uh to look at people um uh to give people uh 
ways to support and help themselves, but without being kind of preachy. Yeah. And what we wanted to do was look at physical mental wellness um, and introduce a number of factors into that. So we create a show a bit like a Top Gear kind of esque yeah. uh, in here, where we'd introduce subject matter experts. Um, we'd have like, uh, you know, a live audience that was drinking and coffee and enjoying, we'd bring on nutritionists who were probably, but all of these people we'd bring on all had real life experiences, yeah. you know, so we were looking at Phil Vickery who, um, you know, he won master chef. He was also the England rugby captain. Mm. We looked at a guy, uh, we brought on called, um, Matt Pritchard, who's famous for doing a show a bit like Jackass, mm. uh, but he's also rode across the Atlantic. So these people are, they've done stuff, you know? Yeah. Um, and then we, we looked at bringing in new bands and, and, and music. And the idea is music evokes emotion and mm. memory. Uh, if you think of every breakup, every operational tour, everything you've ever done, there's a soundtrack. Oh, so yeah, there is. we need to be, we, I think losing the MTV culture of the nineties, we no longer get access to new music, new bands. Mm. So I think by introducing new music to your bands, it's a great way of dealing with your mental health and then putting you in those environments you need to be. You know, so you're getting back in the gym. What tunes are you listening to back in the gym? You're, you're back on your bike. What are you listening to? Um, nutrition, again, not preachy. We just wanted people to look at differently how they ate, eat. I mean, I love eating food. Uh, I love it. I know that I need to stay on my fitness just so I can eat food. Um, <laughs> so I, but also the big things on mental health is if you think about our age, um, we've had transition in our careers. We probably, our kids are growing up or grown up. We probably on our, you know, potentially on our second marriage. Um, we are, we are no longer as fit as we used to be. We've had all these changes in our life. Um, and it's understanding that that's cool. You know, it, that it's, it's all right. You know, you aren't that guy that was running, you know, a mile and a half in eight minutes mm -hmm. or something, you know, you're not that guy anymore. You, you know, you are this new person. So it's been accepting that and realizing that's okay, but how do we sustain you? How do we keep you healthier? How do we keep you happier? Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah, so that, that's, that's what it was. That's what it was all about. So we put it forward for a few people. Um, see if we get picked up would be nice uh, but very much it's a magazine show uh looking at uh physical mental wellness but in a non-preachy way right. and having a bit of fun with it um yeah. yeah um um i think the difficulty we've had is trying to sell it as a product is, is people trying to understand where it fits mm. yeah. certainly in the uk um but you know i know that market because that market is me you know, that, that market is, you know, that guy in his, you know, late thirties, early forties, you know, mid forties, who's, you know, had those changes, had those, those things in your life, you know, and, and, and I know for a while that I'm seeking to that longevity of me and because it's not just about me, Jack, it's about my kids. Mm -hmm. It's about making sure I'm healthy and happy for them. Exactly. You know what I mean? So, oh, exactly. yeah, uh, check it out. It's on uh, YouTube. It's called Own It uh, on HR4K nice. YouTube, and it's called Own It. So, yeah, check it out. If anyone's interested or likes it, give us a shout. We'd be keen to push it somewhere. Yeah, um, yeah see how it goes. But these are kind of – these projects, they're just ideas in my head. And well, I, lost, I lost a friend a few years ago. I remember bringing him back from Afghan, mm -hmm. and his daughter was six weeks old when he was killed. And it was at that point that I, I then had an understanding of morbidity. I had, a, had an understand of, of my own, you know, my own life and what is now important to me. And I think that's where the idea of this show came out of is actually, you know, um, you know, all these changes are happening to you. You are not that 25 year old guy that's on the piss down in uh, the gas lamp, you mm. know, you're not that guy, you know, um, but you try to be that guy. <laughs> yeah. Try as long as we can, but, uh, you know, we're on this journey. That's what I love about that. Uh, how you describe the show there. I mean, we're on this, this journey. And I think that's also one of the reasons that the, the novels have resonated. Um, one, especially the first one, because I'm taking these feelings and emotions behind real events and then I'm applying them to a completely fictional narrative. So, uh, if, if James Reese gets ambushed in Los Angeles, California, I remember what it was like to get ambushed in Baghdad, Iraq. And I take those feelings and I apply them to this story. Um, but more than that, I think what has, um, has led to, uh, the novel 
novels continuing to resonate and the characters continuing to resonate is that James Reese is on a journey and we're all on a journey. That's what, that's one thing we have in common with every other person on this planet is we're on this journey. We don't know when it's going to end. If it's today, tomorrow, five years from now, 10 years from now, you have no idea, but you do have limited time. Um, and everyone's on this journey. Yeah. One shot. And, uh, and James Reese is on a journey. So now He's not just the same character that I pick up from first novel, drop in the second and then pick up, drop in the third. And he's the same person in each one. Nope. He's on a journey like we all are. And hopefully yeah, it's interesting. he's towards learning and adapting. Mm-hmm. Towards the end of it, when he's on that boat, I was actually trying to look and I was trying to sort of see if, how is he dealing with his um, uh, grievance? Is, is he, is he adjusting now? Is he, not normalizing it because it's horrific what happened, but is he understanding that that's happened? This is now me. I need to, to go on. And it's that cliffhanger of, I mean, obviously I haven't read the books, the, the, the other bits, but it's like, didn't he talk about something? In, um, I won't go into detail for anyone who hasn't read it. So, but uh, isn't there an, isn't there a way out? We kind of, uh, you know, there was sort of hints of a way out yes. or a long legacy here, you know, and a bit of a hint. Like picking up on those bits and pieces. It was like, yeah, you know, you'd be all right. Yeah, what's next? <laughs> you know what I mean? So you, you kind of want him to get well. I yeah. mean, obviously he's, he's still driven by something, but you know, you don't want him to be hung up on that because you want to see what else is going on. So yeah, yeah, it's, yeah, it's very, it's well done, mate. It's oh, very, thank you. very well done. I appreciate it. I appreciate it, my friend. Awesome. And I'm looking forward to reading your, your, your work, looking at this at, at, uh, at, uh, ground hammer and, uh, yeah. and checking that out. Grand hammer and the defenders of the realm. Is that, uh, yeah, I cannot it. wait yeah. to check those. Yeah. I love that idea. I think it's a, it's fantastic and, uh, happy to, happy to talk offline about anything as well. And yeah, anywhere I can be helpful, fine. you know, I, I'm more than happy to, to do whatever I can. Yeah, brilliant. Well, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Oh, absolutely. And I hope I can get over there because I, on Instagram, I'll tell you what, I, I, uh, I, uh, do the screenshot every time I see some sort of a cool cafe racer type thing that I'm, and yeah, uh, yeah. a lot of them are in the UK. And so I do these screenshots and I'll send them to another buddy who I ride with. And, uh, I'm like, look at this one. This looks pretty cool. Um, and I love like old retro bikes. There's a place out in actually in Los Angeles that's, uh, putting it's together, you know, shit. BMWs from maybe that's it from like the 60s, 70s, 80s. Uh, and I, I love there's, that. There's a place in LA now called the bike shed. So, that's my uh, it. Vicky, Vicky and Dutch, who own the ones, they're very nice people. They, they've been very kind to oh, me. Oh, very cool. Um, they own the bike shed here in London, oh, and nice. they then opened up in, in L.A. So there's Got one it. over there. Okay, that might good. be it. That might be the one. Yeah, I have so yeah. many different screenshots. I need to make a – because I'm always scrolling through trying to find them again. I need to make a folder once again. I need to – yeah, I need to – the technology part we talked about. I need to make a folder and just put them in there. Um, <laughs> but I'd love to get over there and uh, and pick You'd one up very and ride around and stop by and say hello and have a beer and uh, and check out the operation. I think that would be fantastic. You'd be very welcome. Oh, very thanks, welcome. man. Awesome. And I also love – when guys get out and they found this next passion, they found this next mission, they have this purpose. And uh, a lot of guys have a hard time with that, but you're an example of someone they can look to and say, look at this guy did all this for these number of years. And then he found this next mission and he found this passion and he made it his purpose and drive going forward. Maybe I can do something like that too, or I can, I can find mine. What's my passion? Uh, what's my mission? Okay. Now I have a purpose. Um, and then, so, so you're a, a prime example of that. So, uh, I sincerely appreciate that. And you'll never know how many other people also appreciate it and how many other lives you're, you're changing just through the example. So, so yeah, thank you for that. Hopefully. I think, I think it's very easy to be institutionalized by the military. I think, you know, so, certainly for some boys and girls who didn't have necessarily an easy time uh, in their childhood, mm-hmm. look to the military as that new institution, the comfort blanket. And then when they leave, Uh, going back to that point about own it, you know, these changes in their life, it's like, how do I adjust? You know, where is my comfort blanket? So where a lot of people go into these depression and, and, you know, they look to seek things like PTSD and other things. And you're like, well, is it PTSD? Is it depression? Or is it because there's some big changes in your life and it's how you adjust to them? Um, uh, As we mentioned earlier, there are groupings of people who are more susceptible to it than others. We understand that. Um, but I think it's being able to process that and having that, that support back people around you. Yeah. So using social media positively is obviously a great way. And, uh, and, and looking at these organizations, uh, 
uh, the, the, they're there to, to give you help, you know. Uh, we actually trained all our staff up, uh, mental health, first aid staff. Uh, their job isn't to give advice or, or anything. Their job was just to listen and signpost. Mm. We thought it was a great way of actually having people come in and enjoy the space without feeling like it was um, a charity or a, mm. a drop-in center for you know, waifs and strays. And more importantly, we didn't want it to be a mecca for people who aren't legit, Mm -hmm. which we know there are many that are like that. So what we want to do is ensure that we were true, but yet we still had uh, the means to support the people who truly need it. So that was, that was a cool thing. It was a cool thing in our mission statement anyway. Yeah. Oh man, no, love, uh, love what you're doing. And, uh, let's for sure connect, uh, connect offline about, uh, everything going on with, uh, with ground hammer and hopefully we'll meet up in person for beers soon. Mega mate. Thank you very awesome. much. Awesome. Thanks for everyone. Thank you Cheers, so mate. much. You take care. All the best brother. You Thank too. you. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you to our presenting sponsor, Navy Federal Credit Union. I have been a member since 1996. There is my original card right there. Uh, I got that at Damneck, Neck, Virginia, when I was at Intelligence Specialist A School at the Navy and Marine Corps Intelligence Training Center uh, on Damneck, Neck, Virginia, right before I went to BUDS. So it was boot camp, ISA school, BUDS, and then off to the races in the SEAL team. But the entire time, to include through today, I have been a member of Navy Federal Credit Union. And now they're sponsoring this podcast, which is amazing. Crazy how things come full circle like that. Becoming a member at Navy Federal Credit Union lets you experience more from everyday commutes to your next big vacation. The flagship credit card earns you three times the points on travel so you can get rewarded for wherever you're headed next. Plus this premium travel card has a low annual fee of $49 and two times the points on all purchases outside of travel which means the rewards don't have to end even when the vacation does. Speaking of rewards, you can get a Navy Federal Auto Loan and reward yourself with a new car. Applying is easy. You can do it on their mobile app, online, or by phone. And it's so fast, you can get a decision in seconds. Navy Federal Credit Union has great rates on auto loans. With their car buying service powered by True Car, you can shop, compare, and get upfront pricing on your next new or used are at Navy Federal. Our members are the mission. Nice. I like that. Navy Federal is insured by NCUA, open to the armed forces, the DOD veterans, and their families. Flagship rates are variable and range between 10.74% and 18% APR based on credit worthiness. ATM fees for cash advances are up to $1 at non-Navy Federal ATMs. Credit and collateral subject to approval. Message and data rates may apply. Visit NavyFederal.org for more information and to apply. That's NavyFederal.org. I want to thank my friends at Black Rifle Coffee for sponsoring the Danger Close podcast. I've been a huge fan for the longest time. Drink Black Rifle Coffee every day day. And if you keep your eyes peeled, you will notice that perhaps Chris Pratt is wearing a Black Rifle Coffee t-shirt, not unsimilar to this one in the Amazon series adaptation of the Terminal List. Now you can go to blackriflecoffee.com slash dangerclose and use code dangerclose20 at checkout for 20% off your purchase and your first coffee club order. Black Rifle Coffee, America's Coffee, keep crushing. Thank you so much to Six Hour for jumping right on board out of the gate to make this podcast possible. Obviously, I am a huge SIG fan, having carried the P226 on every deployment downrange in the SEAL teams. Uh, but SIG was a supporter. They were friends well before uh, I was a New York Times bestselling author, uh, well before I even had an Instagram account or any social media presence whatsoever. So thank you guys all so much. Uh, Ron, Tom, Jason, everybody at SIG who gets up every day and continues to crush it and lead the way. SIG is always adapting. They're always at the forefront, whether it is firearms for citizens, whether it's firearms for our military, ammo, suppressors, optics, training, fire control units. They are doing it all and they're always pushing pushing that envelope and trying to do it better each 
and every day through innovation and adaptation, they crush. So thank you so much for that friendship and support. Uh, it will never be forgotten. Welcome to the gear highlight portion of the Danger Close podcast. All right. First off, Matt Graham at Aries Watches. You can uh, find our podcast we did together not that long ago. Matt has an amazing background and makes these watches that I absolutely love. This is the GMT version right here. I get a lot of questions about this one has the date on there as well. So just love what Matt is doing out there at Aries watches. So uh, check them out, Matt. Thanks for everything, my friend. So cool. And Icarus precision right here. Uh, check this out. Let's look at this module right here. This one is for the three, six, five, and they also sent a holster out for it. So a and design, Kydex holster. So I'll be checking that out. And this one is for the pro elite right here. So pro elite module. And, uh, yeah, I, that's just solid. I mean, check out, check out what they have going on. Icarus precision. Thanks guys. And look at this. Bam. Uh, I opened this on my Instagram at Jack car USA, but right here, man, the Grizzly Forge. So go to thegrizzlyforge.com. Lucas O'Hara, Army veteran. He is making blades. Look at that right here in Utah. Check that out. Wow. So cool. Blade and hawk. So that's my first hawk right there from Lucas O'Hara at Grizzly Forge. There you go. You can see it a little better right there but uh check out who you have going on i mean he can't make knives fast enough and uh love when guys get out find that next mission in life passion in life find that purpose and uh man lucas has certainly found his so thank you my friend and what else do i have here aha right here check out this print see that there you go. So this print right here comes from uh, Vickers Guide. So Larry Vickers, James Rupley. Uh, James takes the photos right here. And the Vickers Guide series of books is incredible. They're like coffee table type books, and they are full of information. They're my first stop when I'm doing research on weapons for my novels. So I have the entire collection out there. They have a new one coming out. It's a second edition of the uh, AR-15. Uh, and it's Man, it looks amazing. So I have the earlier editions in there and I uh, can't wait to get this next one that's coming out soon. So they did a few of these prints. So if you ever see them do them, snap them right up, vickersguide.com. Uh, they don't do them anymore. James Rupley found this one for me and sent it, uh, signed by Larry Vickers right there. And man, too cool to uh, just love it. So great photos and the books are just chock full of photos like that and really allows me to uh, go deep onto the descriptions in the novel. So that's it for today. Till the next time, take care out there. Thank you for tuning in to the Danger Close podcast, an Ironclad original presented by Navy Federal Credit Union. To find out more about Ben Garwood, you can follow him on Instagram and that is Ben underscore Garwood underscore B E N underscore G-A-R-W-O-O-D underscore. Also go to his website, hr4k.co.uk. Great website, a lot of interesting things on there. So for sure, check that out. Once again, hr4k.co.uk. You can link to their social channels from there, but on Instagram, it is hr4k underscore, and that's Instagram. And also you can check out Ground Hammer at groundhammer.com. Be sure to check it out. If you enjoyed that conversation, be sure to leave a five-star rating and review wherever you get your podcasts. You can follow me on the social channels at Jack Carr USA. Officialjackcar.com is the website. You can sign up for the newsletter there and you can click shop for the merch. And until the next time, take care out there. Be safe, stay strong, keep fighting.